Ugh, look at them flirting. What an eyesore. But don't get it wrong. Trust me, this is no happy family. That woman there isn't my mom. She's Rochelle, our housemaid. I repeat, housemaid. But it looks like she has her sights set on becoming my stepmom. Ugh. We only hired her because after my mom passed away, Dad and I struggled to deal with our grief, and our clumsiness as well, so tidying the house didn't take priority. I suppose Rochelle was an okay maid. Can't deny that she's a good cleaner, and her cooking is tasty. However, recently, I've noticed that she always cooks Dad's favorite meals. Also, they laugh and flirt and constantly give each other these gooey-eyed looks. Yuck! Today, she even took out her handkerchief and attentively wiped my dad's sweaty forehead. Who does she think she is? She definitely wanted to hypnotize dad. If she thought she'd have a slot in this house, she was totally wrong. I needed to do something about this. I had to talk to dad right away. Dad, mom didn't pass away that long ago, but it looks like you've already lined up her replacement. Didn't you hurt mom enough by reconnecting with your ex right before she died? What do you mean, replacement? Brittany, you're being childish and unreasonable. I don't know, and I don't care. But I want Rochelle to get out of our house immediately. She's for sure trying to get something out of you. Okay, fine. If you insist. But make sure you find a new housemaid to replace her. <sighs> so it turns out that finding a new maid who's actually good is nearly impossible. Dozens of people came to try out, but none of them were as considerate as Rochelle. Okay, after all, we still needed a maid, so I reluctantly let Rochelle stay until I found someone new. This didn't mean I was going to let my annoyance for her slide. I decided that while I was stuck in the same house as her, I may as well play some tricks on her to let out my anger. When she decided to cook, again, the divine chicken soup that my dad loved so much, I kindly added a little salt to make it more savory. But somehow, my dad still praised her delicious food. He must just be flattering her, right? So I tried it for myself. What? How could she do that? It tasted amazing. Ugh. Another time, I copied this trick I saw on TikTok by sticking layers of food wrap on Rochelle's door and acting like there was an emergency. Quick, the oven is making weird noises. I think something's burning. Rochelle quickly ran out of the room and I couldn't help but laugh my head off. Her face was really funny. She then gave me this bewildered look and smiled helplessly. Ugh, why did this woman never get mad? Okay then, let's step it up a notch. I decided to play the ultimate trick. Knowing that Rochelle was scared to death of cockroaches, I cut a cockroach shape out of paper and put it behind the fabric of her nightlight. That night, I was dozing off when I heard a screechy scream, ah, coming from Rochelle's room. Aha, success. But she was so terrified that she fainted. Oops. Do you know what the most annoying thing is? Even after all the trouble I've caused her, Rochelle was still super sweet to me. She was always offering me cookies and asking me about my day and stuff. I felt like she was trying to play the role of a mother, and I didn't like that at all. She couldn't fool me. I knew she only put up with me to please my dad. Thanks to Rochelle, I could never be at ease, even in my own home. But recently, a very special person has come into my life and lit up my mood. It was totally by chance. That day, it had rained like crazy, so there were puddles everywhere. I was on my way home from the grocery store when a car drove whizzing by. I thought I was going to get a free bath, but then suddenly, an arm pulled me back and shielded me with his body. Just like in a romantic movie, standing there was a boy, soaking wet, asking if I was okay. Aww, he had totally swept me off my feet. We walked together for a while and he told me his name's Chris, and he lives in the next neighborhood. That's it! I needed to find a way to impress Chris and also thank him for helping me. So, after some careful thinking, I decided to bake him a cake. I'd seen Rochelle bake before. It looked easy-peasy. 
So I baked one and gave some to my best friend Sue to try. But she spat it out and said, Ew, gross. Hmm. I sadly sat in the kitchen, staring at my pathetic cake, and wondered where I'd done wrong. That's when Rochelle stepped into the room. But to my surprise, instead of laughing at me, she patted me on the shoulder. Come here. I'll teach you how to cook. Rochelle was a good cook, so I'd be stupid not to learn from her. This doesn't mean I like her, though. I just want to win my crush's heart. So after that, each day after school, Rochelle gave me a cooking lesson. Okay, so maybe she wasn't as bad as I first thought. We tried out different recipes together and came up with our own perfect formula. And finally, I could bake a lovely heart-shaped chocolate cake by myself to confess my love to Chris. And you know what? He said, yes. I was so deeply in love with Chris that I totally forgot about my conflict with Rochelle. Chris often came over to my place. My dad and Rochelle loved him. So now, besides my dad's favorite food, Rochelle also makes Chris's favorites too. She's incredible. She could remember everything Chris loves and hates, even the trivia, like he's allergic to peanuts. We were just like a family, and I have to admit, it felt kind of good. And then, out of literally nowhere, the shock of my life happened. My dad passed away from cancer. I didn't even know he was ill. As you might guess, I totally broke down and didn't want to do anything after that. My mom and dad had both left me, just within a single year. But... At least I still had Rochelle and Chris beside me. Rochelle took care of me like I was her actual daughter. I was going through such a tough time in life, but having them around made me feel like I wasn't completely alone. The grief had to fade away eventually, and it's gonna be okay from now on, I thought. Until one day, I was baking cupcakes when my dad's lawyer appeared and showed me the will. Turns out, my dad had left the house to me but only on the condition that I had a guardian. Some woman named Laura. Huh? That's odd. I don't know anyone named Laura, but wait, I think I've heard this name from someone. Oh, my mom. When she was in her last days, mom once told me that my dad had been talking to his ex again, and her name was Laura. Could it be her? Did he seriously make his ex my guardian? Unbelievable! I had to get to the bottom of this, but how could I find this mystery Laura? I had no family. Well, besides my Uncle Colin, who was living in France. So I contacted him and told him everything. He flew back at once, and although I hadn't seen him in years, I couldn't hold back my emotions and ended up sobbing on his shoulder. And then he told me the horrible truth. Laura is none other than the woman who had just walked through the door. It was Rochelle, the woman who had been living in my house. I couldn't believe my ears. What on earth is going on? So Rochelle moving in was no coincidence? My dad sneakily snuck her in as a maid so they could be together? My pain and disappointment were overwhelming, but I had to calm down so I could think rationally. I knew I needed to be smart and outplay Rochelle at her own game. Since then, I started watching Rochelle and noticed something strange. Rochelle and Chris were a bit too close and intimate. I often saw them whispering to each other when they thought I wasn't looking. What did this mean? Could it be that Rochelle was trying to coax my boyfriend into one of her dark schemes? Or worse still, was the guy I love cheating on me with an older woman? My suspicions deepened. When a few days later, Chris told me he was sick, so I had to take the school bus for a couple of days. And Rochelle also asked me for a few days off. Hmm, could it just be coincidence? I didn't think so, so I decided to be a detective for once. Right after Rochelle left, I started following her. And with no surprise, she went to my boyfriend's house. Hi, Mom. Excuse me? Mom? She's his mom? So that means she not only flirted with my father, but also planted her son to distract me to take over my family's property? 
I trusted them. How could they be so cruel? Suddenly, I remembered a detail that I didn't notice until now. After eating the food she'd cooked, for some reason, my father became weaker and weaker and eventually passed away. Did she poison him? If that's the case, then she really is a poisonous snake in human disguise. I immediately broke up with Chris and fired Rochelle, then went home and told Uncle Colin everything. At least I had him on my side. Now what we need to do is refute her custody of the property. I'll take care of everything. You just have to do what I say. Then, Uncle Colin helped me prepare a lawsuit against Rochelle and her son for fraud. Those two will pay the price for what they did to my father and me. Oh, but the thing is, now Rochelle didn't live here, it felt so empty. <sighs> I was so angry with her, but I also found myself missing her too. I loved and trusted her, and Chris too. And feelings like that don't just vanish overnight, but when I was still thinking about it, there was the lawyer. Again! And he was accompanied by Uncle Colin. What's happening now? Miss Brittany Jensen hereby transfers the entire estate of 25 Oakwell House to Mr. Colin Jensen, as signed by both parties. Huh? Signed? When did I sign that? I snatched the paper and shouted, Scam! I never saw this paper! Uncle, what is this? Please say something! I don't know. Just follow the legal documents. No, 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 no! So Uncle Colin was just pretending to care, when really he just wanted to trick me into signing over my house? Oh God, thinking about it, it must have been that day, the day where he gave me a bunch of papers to sign, claiming that they were about me suing Rochelle and Chris. OMG, the lying con! At the time, I'd been so upset that I only skimmed the first page without looking at the following ones. I was too careless. From tomorrow, Miss Brittany Jensen will have to return all assets to Mr. Colin Jensen. You have 24 hours to prepare. I tried shouting at my uncle, and then I tried reasoning with him, but he didn't care. He just smirked at me and told me that he was just taking what was rightfully his. Ugh, what a vile man. So now, I have nothing left. I was kicked out of my own house and deceived by my own uncle. I don't know why I accidentally passed Chris's house just as he opened the door to take a delivery and our eyes met. I turned and started to run away, but Chris caught up with me and grabbed my hand. Even after the awful way I treated them both, Rochelle and Chris still invited me inside and made me dinner. I ashamedly told them what happened. Then Rochelle told me everything. It turns out that my father found out that he had cancer a while ago, but he didn't tell me because he saw how upset I was after losing mom, and he was afraid I would worry too much. Rochelle saw his health deteriorating and figured out what was wrong, so she volunteered to take care of him because she still cared for him. But as a friend, nothing more. As for the will, my dad understood Uncle Colin all too well and didn't trust him, so he gave custody to Rochelle, but unexpectedly, in the end, I still stupidly fell into his trap. As for Chris, I really didn't know you two knew each other until you brought him home. But at that time, I didn't want to confess I was his mother and affect your relationship. I'm sorry, Brittany. Britt, please stay here with me and Mom. We'll get through this tough time together, okay? That's right, darling. No matter what, we'll never abandon you. I... I... I'm sorry. I misunderstood you both. It's okay. Everything will be fine from now on. You'll never have to do this alone. Yeah, every dog has its day. This is totally not wrong. My life is nothing like my previous wealthy one, but I have something that my conniving, vulturous uncle doesn't have, and that's people who love and care about me. What my uncle did was wrong, and Rochelle and Chris are helping me to make a legal case against him. As for now... Well, I still haven't given up on my passion for cooking and still practice with my master every day. <laughs> and you know what? I just won first prize at the city cooking competition. Right, I better go, as I have a big treat planned for Rochelle and Chris.
Hi, Melanie here, and I am hanging on the edge of my seat to hear the results of this year's science fair. I know I might not look like a typical studious girl, but I'm definitely serious about school. Ooh, one second. The winner of West High Science Fair 2023 is Harry Silver. That means the runner-up is Melanie D'Angelo. Congratulations to you both. Please come onto the stage for your awards. Man, I can't believe I'm second to him again. We'd been literally swapping first and second place on every leaderboard since we were kids. Ugh, so unfair. Look at him. All he did was partying and pulling silly pranks, yet he's still on the honor roll, while I had to study day and night to maintain my straight A's. Mmm, mom's taking quite long. What's that commotion over there? This calls for a celebration. What do you guys think? Olive Garden? Yes! Jeez, can you keep it down just a smidge? Come to think of it, people like Harry just have it all, while I only have mom by my side. Oh, she came just in time! Dad left us for another woman a while ago, so my mom had been struggling every day being a single mom. She must be really sad and lonely, so I'd never mention Dad anymore. Poor her. The more I felt for Mom, the angrier I was at Dad. Only my bestie, Izzy, knew about this, cause, you know, it's hard to open up when you're from a broken home. Luckily, there's one thing in this world that could raise my spirits, as well as my heartbeat, in these dark, gloomy days. My dreamy crush, Cameron. Last year of middle school was coming to an end, so I gotta make a move with Cameron fast. The problem was, every time I got close to him, that party pooper appeared out of nowhere to make fun of me. He kept calling me melanin, cause that's what you lack, and bothered me nonstop. We had never gotten along, but seriously? What's wrong with him lately? He picked on me way too much, and why only me? I can't believe everyone thinks he's a model student. To me, Harry's no more than the most annoying bug. All right, hair, makeup, pearly white teeth, check. I'm giving it another go today, waiting for Cameron at his locker with my love letter in hand. As soon as I saw his gorgeous face, I took a deep breath, then put up the sweetest smile, but all of a sudden, someone messed up my hair from behind. Ouch! I turned around to see the culprit. Harry! You look hot. And it generates electricity, too. Now you can charge your phone with your hair. Thank me later. <laughs> oh my god! Nobody should see this Medusa hairdo! My plan to confess failed again before it even started. All thanks to that clown Harry. Wait, isn't that my dad? He was walking out of the principal's office with a much younger woman and a boy my age. From what I gathered, they're saying that his son would go here. Seeing how my dad's starting a new life with his new family, I couldn't help but feel sorry for mom. This is all that woman's fault. If she just disappeared, things could go back to the way they were. But that's merely a wish, and me and mom just have to put up with this boring, unhappy life day by day. Voodoo for dummies? Was some higher power listening to me? This sounds like an answer to my problem. I ordered the book immediately. I started studying all kinds of spells and rituals in it as soon as the package arrived. Voodoo dolls? Interesting. The next day, I went to find Izzy ASAP. Hey, I'm thinking of using a voodoo doll on my dad's new wife to bring my parents back together. What do you think? Does it really work? I don't think... Yo, Wednesday. Sorry. <clears throat> Yo, knock off Wednesday. <laughs> Harry Silver, you are so dead. But wait a second. You know what? We can test it out. Harry would be the perfect guinea pig. What? Him? He's just being his playful self. What if voodoo actually works? Harry doesn't deserve it. Well, I don't think so. Let's make a doll for our little preppy boy then. Crocheting a doll's easy, however the tricky thing was getting my subject's hair, and you bet I won't get physically close to Harry even if someone pays me to. So I got this, a Ouija board. It will help me figure out the code for his locker. There must be a few strands stuck on the fancy hairbrush that he kept inside. Ugh, but none of the combos worked! This is the tenth time already! How about this? There we go! But there were only books inside. Ah, uh, boring! Then the soccer team's changing room it is. I will definitely find something on his uniform. Let's see. Harry Silver. There it is. Aha! Gotcha! I was about to flee the scene when I suddenly saw a boy with only a towel around his waist. Ah! I sprinted to the door and dashed straight through the hallway. That was close. Okay, I still had a voodoo doll to finish. And it's done. I excitedly show Izzy last night's work. Pretty good, huh? It has Harry's hair, too. 
What? How do you know it's really Harry's? What if it's somebody else's? Well, I... Hey, did you hear some perv with panda eyes was creeping around the boys' changing room yesterday? Go away. But don't worry. Starting today, we'll take turns guarding the entrance to catch them. Oh, what a coincidence. You fit the culprit's description perfectly, melanin. But you're definitely not that pervy, are you? <laughs> I was so mad, I felt smoke coming out of my ears. I wish my gaze could kill that rat. Mel, you're squeezing the doll's arm. It's gonna come off. Whoops, my bad. Next time I saw Harry, he had bandages all over his right arm. Hang on, did I do that? Feeling guilty and curious, I approached him. Hey, what's wrong with your arm? It's been in pain since yesterday for no reason. My doctor said nothing's wrong, but I kept feeling like someone's squeezing it really hard. Ugh, there it goes again. Oh, spooky. It means the doll is truly magical. I immediately came running to tell Izzy, and of course, she was shocked too. But hold up, nosy Artie? How long has he been standing here? This guy clearly had heard everything. He kept reaching for my doll. No way. He'd tell the whole school about it. Then suddenly, Harry sat down next to me. Melanie, my arm hurts. Feed me. Ah. Uh... What's he pulling now? Can't he see I'm in the middle of something? Right at that moment, Artie snatched my doll. Leave it to me. No, Artie, no. Not with milk in his mouth. Oops, sorry, I felt so nauseous all of a sudden. That was more than enough to make all of us firm believers. But maybe I should stop. I do feel guilty for dragging Harry into this. That afternoon, when I was about to throw the doll in the trash can, I saw Cameron walk towards me. Did Christmas come early? Hey, I was wondering if you're... Yes, I've been waiting so long for this day. An occultist? What? I mean, Artie was going off about a voodoo doll of yours, so I thought you might know a thing or two about love spells. But if that's not true, I'm sorry. Um, what do you need a love spell for? Then he revealed he wanted to put a spell on his crush, Regina. So all this time, I had no chance with him at all? But hey, a love spell sounds like a brilliant idea. It could ensure my parents' reunion too. Sure thing, but I'll need your hair as well as Regina's. Also, some of your personal items for the spell to work. Obviously, I'll use his stuff, but in a love spell for me. And you know what I gave him? It's all junk with some of my poodle's fur. <laughs> a few days later, I found a gift box in my locker from Cameron. My spell worked. I'm about to have a boyfriend and reunite my family. But before I could carry out that long-awaited plan, Artie came to me with a difficult request, making a voodoo doll of Brad, some transfer student who already established himself as a vicious tough guy. That sounds dangerous, and I already promised myself not to use voodoo anymore. Don't believe me? See for yourself. Then, I followed him and witnessed another student being picked on by a much bigger guy. Hey, isn't he dad's stepson? Okay, this Brad guy deserves it. So I agreed to help Artie. The next day, I approached Brad after class where he usually messed with other students. I managed to sneak up behind him and get one strand of hair. Oh no, busted. I quickly put the hair in the doll. This better work. Come on. Why isn't it working? And why now? Pesky little thing. Stop. Stop. I know those voices. Thank goodness. Touch her and you'll regret it. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll call the police. Brad just scoffed and left. Phew. What are you both doing here? And Harry, I thought your arm hurt. Then Harry and Izzy finally told me that voodoo had never been effective. Izzy knew that Harry only picked on me because he liked me? That's why she tried to stop me from using voodoo on him. But she couldn't, so she then told Harry everything. To be honest, I found your attempts quite amusing, so I acted like they were successful to humor you and myself. I was gonna stop though, but when you were being sweet to me and asked about my arm, I decided to keep it up. Oh. My. God. My bestie had been friends with my mortal enemy all along. Behind my back? Am I a joke to you? Why are you here? To make fun of me even more than you already did? Because I got worried when I heard you're going after Brad. Melanie, you're the smartest girl in school. I don't understand why you're doing all these dumb gimmicks. Yeah, you've been acting strange lately. Since when are you superstitious? What other choice do I have? Voodoo or at whatever cost? I need to get my parents back together. And that punk Brad is my dad's stepson. He deserves whatever comes to him for ruining my life. And you know what else? Both of you get out of my sight for good! Then I stormed off. 
After that day, I no longer talked to Izzy, and Harry's relentless pestering finally stopped. But honestly, it felt a bit empty without them, especially with the upcoming school field trip. Of course, I'm still coming. Who needs them anyway? This is the chance for Cameron and I to be closer now that we're talking on the regs. It's gonna be the best trip ever. I've never been the outdoorsy type, but does camping involve this many physical tasks? Almost done. What on earth is that? Isn't he under my love spell already? I mean, he even gave me a present. I was still in shock when Cameron came over to help with the tent. Thank you. No need to. I can't thank you enough. That spell of yours worked wonders. What does he mean by that? Then, out of nowhere, Izzy tapped on my shoulder. I've tried to tell you. Those two have been flirting for a while now. I guess Cameron just needed your spell as a little spiritual push. That means none of these has ever worked? There's absolutely no hope of bringing my family back? Feeling devastated, I burst into tears and ran off. I was running without looking and bumped into... Brad? Melanie, right? Just who I want to see. Or should I say, my dear stepsister, your mama sent you here. Let go of me and piss off! <laughs> I wonder how pathetic she had to be to have her husband walk out on her. <laughs> if this was any other time, I would have fought back. But after all that just happened, I've lost all of my will to do anything now. Out of the blue, I saw someone charge at Brad and land a brutal blow on his face. I said I'd make you regret touching her. I had to stop Harry before he messed Brad's face up beyond recognition. It's time we got out of here. Why did you come help me after everything I said? I'm kind of used to your coldness. Besides, my love language is following you around and teasing you until you notice or get mad at me. Silly. I know. On a different note, I thought you knew that voodoo was useless. Yeah, so I thought of a love spell to get my parents back together. Then my family will be whole and happy again. But I know it now. There's no such thing as magic. Why not? Magic is alive and well inside you, and it is called forgiving. It cannot punish those who hurt you and your loved ones, but it can help you let go of your pains and sufferings. What are you trying to say? I mean, no magic can make your dad come back, but someday the pain he caused you won't ache anymore. Eventually, your mom and you will heal and lead a fulfilling life without him. I never took this goofy guy for the philosophical and mature type, but I guess he's right. I've been so caught up in my own bitterness that I didn't realize moving on was an option. When my mom picked me up, I decided to finally ask her about my dad. Unexpectedly, mom told me that of course it was sad at first, but she's actually doing fine these days. Life's supposed to have its ups and downs. As long as we welcome them with open arms, everything will turn out all right in the end. After all, your father will have the life he wants while we get on with our our lives. Turned out, I was the only one chasing the past all this time, when what I actually needed was closure. Mom's words were more than enough to put this grieving period behind me. My last year as a middle schooler was quite eventful. Brad was no longer a problem since he got a taste of Harry's fist. Did I mention that we became a trio of best friends? For now, at least. Harry never stopped his shenanigans, but instead of getting annoyed like before, I found him quite adorable and endearing. Oh, just kiss already? Izzy! Hey, I'm Nia, and I've always been a bad girl. I rock the rules. I don't care what people think about my own life and just do whatever I want. You only live once, and I don't waste a second to please others. I love tattoos and have plenty of them all over my body. I got my first tattoo when I was 16. I saved up my birthday money for it and took my older sister's ID when she wasn't looking. It was a cute little purple heart behind my right ear. Also, purple's my favorite color, which made me love it even more. Over the next few years, my tattoo collection grew. I got a part-time job alongside school and then college to pay for them. I love all of my tattoos, as they each have a special meaning. The tribal symbol on my shoulder blade shows that I am strong. The pretty tree and colorful leaf design on my thigh represent both my growth as a person and that fall is my favorite season. The Tinkerbell tattoo on my neck represents my small but fierce personality, and the Pegasus on my arm reminds me that I can fly through tough times. I have more, 18 in fact, all with their own unique meanings to me, but I'll be here all day if I list them all. My parents hate my tattoos, which only makes me show them off more. Whenever there's a family event, I wear an outfit that shows off the majority of my tattoos. My mom usually rolls her eyes at this, and my dad tells me, you could have worn a cardigan. 
Seriously? A cardigan? I'm not a granny. One day, I came to my tattoo artist for a small tattoo on my wrist and saw a guy with completely black eyeballs. I just loved it and longed to be cool like him. The tattooist caught me looking and told me about it. Eyeball tattoos are also known as sclera tattoos, and they're done by injecting color under the conjunctiva, which is the clear membrane covering the front of the eye and over the whites of the eye. That moment, I knew that I had to have it for my purple tattoo collection, but the cost of it was $1,000 per eye, so I had some serious saving up to do. I took on as many extra hours at work as I could, and I also did a few modeling jobs for a fashion company that my friend worked for. I didn't bother telling my family about my sclera tattoo plans as I knew they'd freak out. I mentioned it to a few of my friends. One thought it was cool, while the other one was worried about the risks. She was so concerned that she bought me some funky colored contact lenses. I started wearing them all the time. I loved the reaction people gave me so much that it only made my longing to get my eyes tattooed increase. When my sclera tattoo day came, I was scared, but I was also excited. My tattooist reminded me that this was for life and that there was no going back. I told him to go for it. It was the most uncomfortable feeling in the world. I honestly thought I was going to throw up due to the pain. It felt like shards of glass were being rubbed into my eye. That pain happened four times in each eye, but it wasn't the worst part. I was so stressed during the whole time because if I moved my eyeballs just an inch, the sclera membrane would tear and the eye could be gone forever. Afterwards, my eyes were sore and puffy, but I was happy with the results. The next day, my eyes were swollen shut. I looked like I'd been stung by a swarm of angry wasps. Then, purple dye began streaming down my face, so that I was literally crying purple tears. I contacted my tattooist in a panic, and he told me that it was normal and it would stop after a few days. Over the next few days, the swelling went down, but sometimes it still really hurt inside. The best way to describe the pain is it feels the same as a throbbing headache, but in my eyes. I put up with the pain as the results were striking. I was so unique and elf-like. Naturally, my parents completely freaked out. Sometimes, when my mom looks at me, she starts sobbing. She's melodramatic, and there's no need for it. I loved going to concerts and tattoo conventions with my friends, as people always stopped me and complimented my eyes. I stood out from the crowd, and I loved it. A lot of people ask if it's contacts. That's the number one question. It kind of bothers me, actually. They'll say, oh, I love your contacts, and I'm like, they're not contacts. I went through far too much pain and spent way too much money for idiots to confuse them for contacts. After a week, my one eye was fine, but my other eye started leaking purple all the time. I'd come home with purple ink stained down my face. I had a permanent aching in that eye, and it was continuously sore and itchy. It got so bad that I'd even tear out blood. It happened in public a few times. One little kid saw it and cried to his mom that I was a monster. My tattooist kept telling me it was fine. Stupidly, I trusted him, as he'd done most of my other tattoos. Then, two weeks went by. One morning, I woke up and couldn't see a thing through that swollen eye. It was completely shut! I rushed to the hospital in panic, where I received steroid drops to decrease swelling. But it didn't work. I still couldn't be able to see anything out of that eye. It turns out that I shouldn't have trusted my tattooist, as while he was injecting color between the two layers inside of my eye, he injected the undiluted dye way too deep into my one eye. This caused the eye to swell and the ink to seep out. His bad, unprofessional tattooing has resulted in several trips to the hospital with hemorrhage and sclera tearing. I am now permanently blind in my one eye. My mom still sobs when she sees me. People still cross the street to avoid me, and I've missed so much college with my hospital visits that it's likely I'll have to retake the year. I was foolish to rush into getting my eyes tattooed without thinking through the possible risks. I naively told myself that nothing bad would ever happen to me, but something bad did. Now, when I look in the mirror, I find the girl staring back at me disgusting. My need to look unique and different cost me my sight in one eye and my cute, natural looks. I made the wrong decision, 
and now I'll have to live with it. I now know that I didn't need to get eye tattoos to stand out. I was already unique. I just didn't realize it. We're all special and we're all different from each other. Please embrace who you are and don't take dangerous risks to change the way the world sees you. Huh. <sighs> It's been a long time since I was able to enjoy myself at a party. It sure felt good. Now just one thing left to make this night even more perfect. I'm going to make my crush mine. There he is! Jad! O.M.G. Did he just glance at me? I could feel my heart flutter. As I immersed myself in a world with only Jad and me, the face of Harry the Metal Mouth suddenly popped up from nowhere. It's time for bed, mommy's little princess. What on earth was he saying? And why was everyone running toward the window like that? I jostled into the crowd and I peeked down. Oh, for heaven's sake! The beyond cringy woman standing there holding the speakerphone was none other than my mom! Janice, it's 10 p.m. You know it's your turn to stay with me tonight. I won't be able to sleep without you. God, is there any way for me to just evaporate right here, right now? This is too embarrassing. But wait, how did she know I was here? I immediately looked over at Christine. It must be her again. Everyone knew she had a huge crush on Jad too, and would do anything to get him. She's definitely the snitch. <sighs> it's so frustrating. Anyway, let me fill you in on the situation. This crazy woman is my mom, who gave birth to not only me, but also my older sister Patty and my big brother Will. I guess we all turned out alright, but this wasn't down to mom. She didn't raise us, our nanny Randy did. You see, mom used to be an actress. She was always busy, busy, busy with her work and her numerous flings. Which resulted in each of us three having a different father. Luckily, we had Randy to take care of us, so I never felt like I was missing out on anything. On the contrary, having to see mom all day is a problem for me. A month ago, mom suddenly decided to retire and move in with me and my siblings. And who knew that an out-of-date star could be such a childish, clingy nightmare? Ugh! She didn't like being alone, so she insisted Patty and I had to take turns sleeping next to her. Then, she forced us to accompany her to the mall and be her luggage gophers and talk to her while she went for the zillionth beauty treatment of the week. One day, after an exhausting day out with mom, we entered the house to Will rushing over and shouting. Mom, why did you tamper with my laptop? It turned out that Will had applied to the Juilliard Institute one of the most famous art institutes in New York. But mom went on his laptop and deleted the school's acceptance email, meaning poor Will had missed out on the response deadline. Oh, sweetheart, I didn't mean to. I was trying to send an email to report those scammers on TV. But I must have accidentally deleted your email. That's probably a good thing anyway, son. It would be better to apply for an economics major at the state university, so our family won't have to be apart. Do you know how hard it was to get in there? Ugh, I can't do this right now. I'm done. Dinner with mom tonight was super awkward. It was just me and her, as Will was simmering in his room, and Patty, well, I don't know where she was. Afterward, I passed by her room and overheard a whimpering sound. I peeked through the gap in the door and saw Will also trying to calm Patty. James is now insisting on breaking up with me. If mom hadn't come to my company and bragged that her daughter was the manager's girlfriend, the story wouldn't have reached my boss and neither of us would be in this mess. I know, right? Mom never cared about us before, but now she thinks she can just waltz back into our lives and do whatever she wants? I've had enough of this. We're both over 18 now. Let's just move out. Oh, no, 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 no. No! Look at their determined eyes. I couldn't let this happen. What about me? Please don't go. I'm not 18 yet. Don't leave me alone with mom. I beg you. Both of them gasped when they saw me. Then after a moment of silence, Will spoke up. Okay, we won't go. But at least we need to get things back to normal. I mean, back to just the three of us and Nanny Randy living in this house. And so, Will suggested we pull a bunch of pranks that would annoy mom so much she'd end up leaving. But they were all busy with their studies and work, so they left it to me to carry out the pranks. Okay then, I'm ready. 
You can see how my mom was addicted to cola from the pile of empty cans over there. She often did midnight dashes to the convenience store when she ran out. So, my first plan was to make all the cola she's just bought disappear time after time. <laughs> Frustrated much? However, she was strangely calm and acted like it's no big deal at all, and even bought a drinking helmet to make sure her coke was always with her. Attempt failed. Move on to the second plan. Hide the Nintendo Switch. Why, you ask? Every night, mom made us play on that thing with her, and honestly speaking, she was the worst player ever, but she wouldn't accept it, and kept making us play those boring games with her until she won. Now, no switch, no troubles, right? Wrong! As having nothing to do, she came up with much more dumb things to ask us to do with her. From teaching her to cook, gardening, and even doing yoga with her. Having mom around is like caring for a toddler. She needs constant care and attention. It's tiring. I can't bear it anymore. You clearly didn't carry out the tricks properly. You're making the situation even worse, don't you see? <sighs> Looks like we'll have to get the job done ourselves. Oh yeah? Fine. You guys do better then. And so they carried on by using mom's ultimate fear of spiders. She's terrified of them. Even the teeny tiny ones were enough to cause her to climb onto a chair in fright until one of us removed it. So, Patty asked me to buy fake spiders online. Then she hid them all over our house. But this time, without panicking, she even picked it up and tossed it in our direction, which freaked us out instead. So, Will decided it was his turn to take some action. He planned that one evening, I would distract Randy, and in the meantime, Will would throw a feast at home then swiftly drag all his friends out, leaving a huge mess for mom. Despite never lifting a finger on cleaning, mom is actually a clean person, so it would definitely drive her crazy. But nope, once again, it didn't go as planned when Will and Patty came home to find Randy there, helping mom clean up the whole mess. Of course, I was the one who got the blame, again. Janice, you told us you were able to get Randy away from the house for a day, didn't you? I... I did ask her to take me to Dad's, but like midway there, she realized she forgot her phone and insisted on going back. Oh, stop with all the excuses. You're so useless and always do things by halves. The spider trick must have also failed because you bought some cheap ones that look too obviously fake. Yeah, perhaps you've been bought off by Mom, aren't you? Spill it! Ugh, are they seriously accusing me of betrayal right now? Enough! If you're that good, then do it all yourself! I stormed off without any extra words to them. The next morning, while watching Netflix, I heard Patty and Will arguing. It turned out Patty let her boyfriend use her car and he forgot to come pick her up to work. So she's trying to borrow Will's bike so she wouldn't be late for a meeting. But Will wouldn't let her because he had an important dance workshop to attend. Don't your dumb class just always repeat the same wriggle moves? Take the bus instead. You won't die if you're a little late. It's not my fault your gold digging boyfriend forgot to pick you up in your own freaking car. You should have broken up with a jerk like him ages ago. They continued quarreling for a while until I saw Will launch his way down from upstairs shouting. Fine, just take it. Has anyone ever been able to stop you from anything, bossy patty? And he headed straight outside to his bike, then came back after a bit, probably to get some air to calm down. Ugh, would these two give it a rest? How were we meant to figure out a way to win against mom when they couldn't even go a day without bickering? Right then, mom walked in and told me she was going to bake the cake patty had shown her how to do yesterday. Oops, but I forgot to buy eggs. I wonder if Will needs to use the bike today. I'll borrow it just for a bit. Ha! Great! If mom took the bike, then both of my annoying siblings would have to stop squabbling about it. Right? Yes, mom. Take it. Will said he was gonna take the bus today. It'll be faster to cycle to the grocery store anyway. Then mom hopped on the bike and shakily rode off. After a while, Will and Patty went out to the yard and of course, the bike was no longer there. After I told them that mom had already taken the bike, Will stopped dead. Because the truth was that he had purposely broken the brake so that Patty wouldn't take it. Patty tried calling mom but she didn't pick up. Then came a call from Randy. She told us that mom had crashed the bike and had been hospitalized. Oh no. We rushed there immediately. Unfortunately, apart from a ligament sprain, she's fine. It could have been much worse, but that meant she had to wear a bandage for a whole month to stabilize her leg. 
Ugh, this was all our fault. So now we had no choice but to whimper to mom's every demand. Mom insisted I spoon feed her all of her meals. When I mentioned that there was nothing wrong with her hands, she told me that the trauma to her leg had affected her entire body. She made Patty light loads of candles, play soothing melodies, and rearrange her bedroom furniture so she had a relaxing space to heal. And she got Will to download her old movies for her and feed her popcorn while she watched them on repeat. Of course, we were really worried about her and hoped she'd recover as soon as possible, but honestly, her ridiculous demands were going too far. Then, one day, she insisted we go to a picnic, as sitting inside all day was making her depressed. So, we did exactly just that. Then, while we were walking on a slope, I dropped my bag and bent down to pick it up. Oops, I forgot to lock the wheelchair's wheels! I gasped as I saw mom whiz down the hill. But immediately, she hopped out of the chair and landed on her feet perfectly fine. Will and Patty stared in confusion at mom's casque de like performance. What about me? <laughs> nah, I'm not surprised at all, cause I was the one who set this whole thing up to expose mom. Nanny Randy has told me everything. I know she has been helping you dodging our tricks, as well as carrying out that fake bike accident. Please, why do you have to make life so difficult for us? You never even cared about us, did you? As soon as I finished, mom burst into tears. Then she began to pour her heart out. As it turned out, after her career finished, all the fortune, glory, friends, colleagues, and even men who once said that they'd love her for the rest of their lives, turned their backs on her. She was extremely lonely and needed us, her children, more than ever. Now I only have three of you. In the past, I didn't fulfill my responsibilities as a mother, and I know I let you all down. But now I realize my mistakes. I only did what I did because I wanted to draw you back close to me. Please, forgive me. Give her a chance, kids. Although your mother's actions were somewhat misjudged, she only did them because she genuinely cares about you. Janice, she worried your partying was causing you to neglect your studies. Well, she didn't want your dancing dreams leading to showbiz nightmares like hers. And Patty, trust your mom, she was right this time. Turns out, mom once caught James, the manager, aka Patty's boyfriend, secretly dating the receptionist. <laughs> so she intentionally made a fuzz at Patty's office to deter the third wheel. However, what came after didn't go as she expected and led to such a mess. But now, mission complete. We came here to catch Patty's cheating boyfriend red-handed. Or should I say, her ex-boyfriend. And of course, we made sure he paid for a worthy price for his actions. Ah. <sighs> Justice has been served. <laughs> now, to relax. Patty and mom are getting along much better now. They even look more like an endearing couple of sisters than mother and daughter. <laughs> Will's taking mom to one of his contemporary dance shows, so she can see how important it is to him. And me? I may be the youngest in the family, but while Will's away, it's my job to make sure mom has someone to lean on. And I'm glad to take on this role. Maybe having my mom around isn't actually bad after all. Hi, my name's Laura and I'm 14 years old. When I was a kid, I went through so much traumatic stuff that it has left me permanently scarred in the craziest way. I was three years old when my dad died from a heart attack. My mom really couldn't cope after this. She started drinking and smoking a lot. So my grandparents stepped in and decided to take care of me for a couple of years. But then three years later, my mom got diagnosed with cancer and died. It was a complete nightmare for me. But luckily, my grandparents were there for me. I used to secretly cry myself to sleep every night, and then during the day, I'd try to smile and pretend to be happy, as not to worry my grandparents. It was such a tough time for me. Fast forward four years, and I started getting these weird blackouts every day. At first, I thought it was because of school or something, so I didn't really pay attention to it. But then, one day, I was at my best friend Maria's house for a sleepover, and it happened. I walked into her room, and suddenly, I blacked out. When I woke up the next morning, Maria was staring at me and looked kind of scared. She said I'd acted like a completely different person the night before. I couldn't remember anything and felt so embarrassed. So I told her I needed to go home and rushed out of there. When I got home, I googled blackout and memory loss. And suddenly, a page popped up saying DID symptoms. So I clicked on it to see what it said. It said things like, a person may experience blackouts and act differently. 
so I ran downstairs to tell my grandparents about it. They weren't surprised and said they'd noticed I'd acted a bit strange sometimes, so they called the hospital to arrange an appointment for the following day. Maria texted me to ask if I was okay, so I asked her to tell me about the night before. She said she'd asked me if I wanted to eat pizza for dinner, and I told her that I'm not hungry, which is weird as I'm pretty much always hungry. Then she said I just sat on her bed texting someone, and that I looked like a robot. I wasn't smiling or laughing or anything. It was kind of creepy, so she left the room for a bit. But when she came back, I was playing with her dog, looking all playful and hyper. All that really freaked her out. The next day, my grandparents took me to the hospital to get some tests done. I was feeling so scared by this point. I had to get an MRI scan on my head. And afterwards, the doctor walked me up to my grandparents and started whispering to them. I couldn't hear anything the doctor was saying, but the next moment, my grandma was crying. I felt so sad. I'd never seen her cry before, and I couldn't stand it. The doctor turned to me and explained that I have something called Dissociative Identity Disorder, DID. Basically, this means I have multiple personalities, and in my case, I have four. I've even given them names. Emily, Lily, Anna, and of course myself, Laura. The doctor tried to ask me about when this could have started and what could have been the cause of it, and it seems it had to be because of my parents passing away. That's the most traumatic memory I could think of. It's been a while ever since I was diagnosed. It has gotten my life much more complicated, but I've kind of worked my way around it. I once asked my grandma to help me figure out what these personalities were like, as every time it happened, I blacked out and couldn't remember anything. She had helped me ask the personalities the same questions and noted down things that happened. So, visual-wise, our styles are quite similar. We all like wearing jeans and crop tops, except for Lily. She prefers leggings and an oversized hoodie. The one thing about us that's really different, and by looking at this, you will be able to tell us apart, is how we do our hair. I like mine half up, half down. Emily likes hers down. Lily likes hers in a ponytail, and Anna likes hers in a messy bun. We also found out that Emily likes pop music. Her favorite hobby is dancing, and she hates sweets. Any ideal day to her would be sitting by the window with her cat while sipping her tea. Then there's Lily. She doesn't like music at all, and she likes to go skating and eat healthy food. She spends all her free time at the skate park. Lastly, there's Anna. She's really quiet and likes classical music, reading books, and drawing. I too love drawing, so maybe my personality is closest to Anna's. Sometimes we would leave notes for each other on a piece of paper if we have something to tell the other personalities, as that's the only way for us to communicate. DID is something I've just had to get used to. The change usually happens anywhere between two to six hours after a personality takes control, but when I'm stressed, it can happen every 30 minutes. The longest I was one personality was eight hours. It was Lily, and she went to the skate park and broke her leg, but luckily, we're okay now. Lily is definitely the rebel one. One time, she took my paints and wrote on the class bully's locker, you are a loser, Mackenzie. I mean, it served her right. This girl was a serious bully. Usually, I can feel when I'm about to change personalities, but I can't decide which one will take control. Sometimes, different things can trigger the change, too, like some certain smell or the place or food that is special to a specific personality. Cool, right? It doesn't always go to plan, though. On many occasions, I've burnt my toast or pancakes because I had a switch while making breakfast. I just froze there for a moment. It's kind of funny. And one time when I was 12, I was in a school play. I was playing the main character, and in the middle of the play, I changed personalities. It was so embarrassing. But before the play, I made sure all of my personalities knew the lines. So I think it was okay in the end. For the most part, people are understanding. My teachers know about it, and no one usually notices when it happens in class, as the only thing I do is change my hairstyle or the way I hold my pen. But some people are a bit mean to me. They say I'm faking it or doing it for attention. But I just ignore these people. They have no idea what it's like to live with this. Then there are nice moments, like the drawing my friend's little sister did for me. It had four girls on it, all of my personalities, and it was super cute. I also have had a girlfriend before, and she was super understanding. Despite me switching personalities during our dates, it was undeniably awkward, but we just laughed it off. All four of us loved her, and the same goes for everyone else in our lives. We've agreed on only meeting people that we all like, because if one personality doesn't like a person, it can get kind of annoying. And so, this is my life. 75% of the time, I am not Laura, not myself, but it's something I've just had to learn to live with. There's no cure. 
so all I can do is endure it and try to make life easier. And even so, I love myself. All four versions of me. I dashed along the hallway, then skidded to a halt in front of the classroom door. Ah, uh, I was late. Again. Miss Anderson, what's your excuse today? Morning, sir. I'm sorry, but my spaniel hit my shoes, then I tripped over a package by my front door, then my heap of a junk car wouldn't start, and that's enough. Good God. Please sit down. Ashley already took attendance. What? So much for my perfectly crafted excuse. Mr. O'Shaughnessy totally would have let it slide, but she had to ruin it. I'm Ashley. I'm pretty. I'm perfect. Everybody likes me. Well, no one likes teacher's pets, Ashley. Think I'm being too harsh on her? <laughs> Just ask anyone about Ashley Mae Anderson. Ashley's father's a vet with a Medal of Valor. They even had dinner with the president at the White House. For her sweet 16, she rented out the swankiest club downtown for an entire weekend. And David Guetta DJed. Ashley dated two college boys at the same time, and when they found out, things got physical. Okay, okay, maybe not all of that was true, but who cares? Look, the main character here is me. Hi, my name's Ashley Mae Anderson. I know, what a freaky coincidence, right? But that's the only thing we had in common. Because unlike popular Ashley, I'm just a normal teen who's just minding her own business. But then she transferred here and messed up everything. This happens every time I open my locker. And they're not addressed to me, but to Ashley. Jeez, why do boys go so cuckoo bananas over that pretentious princess? I gathered that whole cluster and dumped them on Ashley's desk. Here's your delivery for the day. Oh, I have no use for those things. You can keep them if you want. <laughs> how snobby. I know those rumors weren't all lies. All right, if you said so. Being mistaken for Ashley was so annoying that I did consider putting a sign on my locker or something. But I suppose sometimes it actually had its perks. Like when I accidentally knocked over a trash can in the school's parking lot. But upon knowing my name, the janitor said my father was his commanding officer back in the day and let me off. And believe it or not, these mix-ups didn't only happen at school. Once, my family went out for dinner and the staff at this restaurant thought we were the other Andersons. They must be some really important people cause the super attentive waiters topped up our drinks for free and gave us complimentary desserts. Pretty sweet, right? Only when we were leaving, things almost went south when the manager shook my dad's hand and said, Thank you for your service. My dad seemed confused, but fortunately, I dragged him away before they busted us. I mean, Ashley's been enjoying these privileges her entire life, so it's fair I benefit a little from them. Especially since I have to endure being called her Walmart version. Anyway, back to me. I arrived home to find a teary-eyed girl sitting on her front porch. She must be one of Billy's exes. If your brother's a jock that all girls flock around, you'd get used to this real soon. He went through girlfriends quicker than hair gel, and he always had some peeves about them, like Mandy, too clingy, Katie, too dramatic, Maggie, too flirty. The list goes on. Then, as soon as my backpack hit the bedroom floor, my door burst open. Hey, I need your help. What? Need a hand to make up with Cry Barbie out there? She's ancient history. Check this out. Her name's Jane Brown. Ain't she a beaut? I immediately recognized her. She's the waitress that he kept eyeing the other day. Now, he needed my help to ask her out and not seem creepy. So, I suggested taking her to his friend Alexander's party this weekend. How do you know about that? Isn't that cool people exclusive? As if I wanted to. I was added to their group chat by accident because they thought I was Ashley. <laughs> right. Hot Ashley. You should come too. I'll be with Jane, but Victor will be there. Wait, I'll see my crush at that stupid party? Sign me up then! Jocks, cheerleaders, stuck-up kids. This place was packed with people like Billy. My brother briefly introduced me to the host Alexander, while Madison followed him around looking all shy and gooey-eyed. Wasn't she bothered that all Alexander seemed to care about was if anyone had seen Ashley? I also got to officially meet Jane, but the person I was looking for was Victor. 
He's so much more than just a cute face in the crowd. He's the peanut butter to my jelly. But before I could talk to him, a bunch of dudes popped out of nowhere. This is Ashley? Oh man, I thought she was supposed to be pretty. No offense though. She's a six if you squint hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm squinting now and you're barely even a two yourself. No offense though. What, what did, did you, you say? say? <laughs> Don't worry, you could still go after pretty girls. They just need a crate of fear first. The crowd suddenly felt silent and stared at us. This party is so lame. Peace out, losers. Anywhere is better than that stuffy elitist hellhole. But it's a bummer I didn't get to talk to Victor. He's Billy's best bro and used to come hang out at our place pretty much every day. But not anymore. Gus has been avoiding me ever since I told him I had feelings for him. <sighs> I was going to settle things with him tonight, but those jerks ruined it. Do I need to print my own t-shirt saying, I'm Ashley, you must be looking for Ashley? The next day, while looking for Victor, I heard someone calling my name. But I turned around only to see Alexander calling for, ugh, Ashley. So annoying. I saw him make a move on her, but she said guys like him bored her, then proceeded to list all his flaws. Oof, harsh. From then on, I tried my best to avoid Ashley, and thought my life would be light and breezy. But nope. On the contrary, I found myself in a series of unfortunate events. One day, a stack of religious magazines randomly showed up on our doorstep. But the real kicker was, they were all addressed specifically to me! And there was absolutely no way to convince my family and neighbors that I wasn't a member of the Church of Scientology. Two days later, all of my clean clothes had some weird stains and holes on them. I had to beg Billy to lend me some of his. That day, I went to school in an old jersey, looking like a midget. <sighs> Then, this Monday, I became the center of attention by showing up with my face covered in pimple patches and band-aids. Well, that's because I woke up to countless cystic acne and didn't have enough patches. This resulted in me being called the mummy for five days straight. But the final straw was my car having two flat tires. The clock was ticking, so I asked Billy to take me to school. However, he just flat out refused, saying he'd already promised to pick Jane up. No other choice, I had to ride my old bike. When I saw Billy's car in the driveway, my pettiness got the better of me, so I splashed my half-empty milk carton over the windshield. I'm on my way. Oh my god, you little brat! Sorry babe, you won't believe what my sister just did. Seeing Billy's reaction was chef's kiss. <laughs> you got it coming, big bro. The next day, my car was fixed, so I managed to get to school early. Looks like my string of bad luck was finally over. Okay, let's see who wants to confess to Queen Ashley today. From... Victor? Oh no, why him? I stood there, frozen with a letter in my hand, still processing the situation when a friend came and showed me something on her phone. It's a video of me singing and dancing in my room. No one's supposed to see this, ever. It had been uploaded by some throwaway account, but who else could it be but Jesus Christ, Billy. I rushed home to see Billy and Jane cuddling in the living room. How's he still so calm after pulling that on me? I confronted him and he didn't even bother denying it and even said that's what I deserved for vandalizing his car. We screamed and shouted at each other, but before we ended up in a fistfight, he stopped and stumped off to his room. I was still fuming, glaring at his shadow, and I saw Jane gawping at me in delight. Don't blame your poor brother too much, dear. It was I who pulled the strings. What? Jane? But why? We'd barely even interacted. Then she went on about all of my mishaps lately were her doings. Yep, my so-called bad luck, it had been Jane all along. That's for stealing Alexander from my sister. He's her first love. Do you know how heartbroken Zoe has been? Wait, Zoe who? And why on earth would I choose to mingle with that playboy Alex? Kudos to this girl for thinking I could ever steal someone's boyfriend. Hello, I'm still struggling with my lifelong crush over here. I tried to tell her she made a mistake, but she wouldn't listen. Stop denying it. I know it's you. You're East High's Ashley with a vet dad. That checked all the boxes already. Hold up. There's another Ashley Mae Anderson in our school. She's Ashley with EY. 
I'm Ashley, E-I-G-H. Her dad is a war veteran. My father is a veterinarian. Oh, snap. Good lord. She devised this intricate plan, approached Billy just to make it work, and was successful for the most part. Well, apart from having the wrong person. Just amazing. Jane apologized and promised to take down the video. However, she wanted me to help her take revenge on Ashley in return. I didn't want to get involved, but I also never wanted to be on her bad side again, so I reluctantly agreed. But if you think about it, Jane's story didn't quite add up. Ashley seemed to have a holier-than-thou attitude and had dozens of admirers waiting in line. Why would she get in between them? Not to mention, Alexander's a notorious player who Ashley already ruthlessly rejected. I believe there's more to this. As expected, thanks to that video, my school life was now even more awkward than usual. But it didn't matter, as I was too preoccupied with Operation Ashley. Today's mission, approach her after cheerleading practice. I stood in the corner, behind the bleacher, waiting for my chance. But before I showed myself, I saw Madison march over, say something to Ashley, then storm off. After that, Ashley started sobbing? I didn't know what happened, but I felt bad for her, so I tried comforting her, but she kept brushing me off. Look, you can keep the ice queen act all you want, but I know you have feelings too. I thought you might have something else you want to share with me, not just the name. And it was like I pulled a lever that let out all of her bottled up emotions, and we had a heart to heart all afternoon. Just as I thought, things weren't what they seemed. We'd better talk this through with one another. So I set up a meeting at a cafe in the South Coast Plaza, as they wouldn't dare to cause a scene in public, right? Anyway, Ashley clarified that Alexander and her weren't a thing, while assuring Zoe that she deserved a guy much better than him. But Alex was really sweet to me. He gave me this present on our one month anniversary. Did he say it's his grandmother's? Yeah. He tried giving me an identical one on my birthday. I'd say you dodged a bullet when you two broke up. Please, look at yourself first. You two flirt with boys left and right and still act all high and mighty. Get off that high horse. Ashley seemed genuinely hurt by Jane's words that it took her a while to speak up. I'm just sick and tired of being the popular girl who has to live up to everyone's expectations. It's too exhausting. I thought transferring here would mean a fresh start, but everyone still has this impression of me which I can't seem to change. The rest of us looked at each other in confusion when we saw how sad Ashley's situation actually was. We didn't know there were so many downsides to being high school popular. Ashley, you know you can just be yourself, right? The world will have to accept you for who you truly are. If people don't like you, then so be it. Yeah, if they don't, that's their problem not yours. You can't fit into a mold to please everyone, cause there's no such thing. I don't want to agree with her, but she has a point. Let the whole world know the real Ashley, and you too, Zoe. Someday, you'll find a good guy who loves you for yourself. Alright girls, that's settled. Now, I have to deal with my own mess. Billy found out the truth and now he's been ghosting me, but I swear to god, I'm in love with this guy. Gotta go, bye! I couldn't believe I was rooting for my saboteur and her accomplice to be together. But here I was. Go get him, tiger! The next Monday, Ashley walked to class and had lunch with me instead of Madison and her clique. And of course, this didn't go unnoticed. You left us for her? What is she? You're not hot, sister? <laughs> Before I could clap back, Ashley stood up and unleashed her inner sass. This is me living my life as my true self. If any of you bootlickers have something to say about that, you can shove it where the sun won't shine. Sweet Mary Jesus and Holy Spirits! Who knew she had it in her? Her words completely decimated those hyenas. And suddenly, someone grabbed my wrist. Victor? Slow down! Where are you taking me? Besides, you got the wrong person, and also the wrong address for this. You should give it to her yourself. Actually, I sent it to the right girl, but apparently, she still hasn't opened it. Wait... What? And you're right, I should tell her myself. It's just that Billy and I made a deal that sisters are off-limits, so I thought it's better to avoid you. 
but hearing Ashley talk about being herself made me realize that I'm sick of hiding my feelings. I'm gonna make Billy see how sincere I am for you. Before I do that, Ashley, I like you. And, um, will you go on a date with me? Yes! Um, I mean, yeah, I suppose that would be cool. This is beyond my wildest dream! Not only do I have a brand new friend, but also a date with my dream guy! Fortune is finally smiling on me. <laughs> Admit it. Come on. You took my necklace, didn't you? Mindy looked at us and shook her head. She was sweating. Well, there are only three of us in this house, and if Andy didn't take it, then obviously it was you. Seriously, Cass, you got to believe me, I didn't take it. But clearly, she was lying, because when I rummaged through her bag, Cass's necklace was right there. Cass told her to get out of her house, and Mindy burst into tears. Poor Mindy. I really wanted to stop Cass, but she seriously hates people touching her stuff, so I just kept quiet. You see, Cass and I are pretty much joint at the hip. We've always lived in the same neighborhood, so we grew up together and shared everything. Well, almost everything. Except one little secret that would probably ruin our friendship forever if she found out about it. Andy, what are you doing? I started to stammer. Uh, um, uh, um, this is so cute. Honestly, I'm so upset about Mindy. I can't believe she'd do something like that. I smiled, not knowing what to say. I mean, it was me who'd exposed her. Suddenly, I felt so guilty. Right at that moment, we got to the checkout. Cass took everything out of the cart to give to the cashier. Hang on, she exclaimed. What is this? This item has the barcode ripped off. The cashier made a fuss for a while and even called the manager. Cass and I stood there for ages, trying to figure out what was going on. Cass even started crying, thinking she'd be accused of shoplifting. After about 30 minutes, the store manager came and told us we could leave. They kept the items that had no barcodes and sent us on our way. Phew, that was close. What? What do you mean? Oh, nothing. I'm just relieved that we didn't get into any trouble. Just so you know, though, that wasn't the first time we'd got ourselves into an awkward situation while out shopping. Sometimes it was the torn barcodes. Sometimes the tags were missing. Then the security alarm would always go off at the door. And all of these situations weren't just coincidences. Okay, I gotta be honest here. The thing is, I have a habit of pilfering. Not because I can't afford stuff. I mean, my dad's the owner of a bank, so money isn't the issue. My dad basically buys me the latest phone every month. And you should see my wardrobe. I have all the designer bags. I steal because it gives me the kind of thrill that my boring daily life just can't give me. My dad just hands me money every day. And never stops to think that maybe I'd like a hug or a how are you. Ever since my mom left when I was just a baby, he's been using money as a way to keep the peace. So one day when I was in elementary school, I stole a hairpin from the girl who sat next to me. It felt so good. Like my own little secret. I loved the drama that came with it. And the fact that no one ever suspected me because I was such a rich little girl. After the hairpin, I got addicted to stealing little things and couldn't stop. It felt like the only thing I could control in my life. And so I kept on doing it. And here I am now, still getting a buzz from it every single time. And yep, you've guessed it. The one who took the necklace at Cass's sleepover was none other than me, of course. But at that time, because I was so scared, I slipped the necklace into Mindy's bag and pretended to find it there. I was deep in thought when suddenly Alex's scream startled me. Guys, I've lost my unicorn pen. You know the pen that glows? The whole class was suddenly in uproar. Some friends were trying to look for it, Meanwhile, Alex was walking straight towards me. Andrea must have taken it. This morning when I took out the pen, me and her were the only ones in here. I looked up at Alex, my heart pounding in my chest. This is it. I'm so done this time. Then I suddenly looked over at Scott Parker, the cute boy who just transferred to our class. Oh no, I couldn't give him a bad impression of me. I had to quickly think of a way out of this. You waited until I went to the bathroom to take it, didn't you? Alex, I'd never do such a thing. Besides, I have loads of nice pens. In fact, you can have one if you'd like. 
I pulled out a beautiful pink rhinestone pen from my pencil case and handed it to Alex. While Alex stared in awe at my pen, I suggested everyone go check their lockers to see if her pen was there. Sure enough, right by the lockers was the glowing unicorn pen she'd lost. Right in front of Scott. I picked up the pen and handed it to Alex. I'm so upset you thought I'd steal this from you. But it's okay. At least we found it. Alex blushed and apologized to me. Our other friends also blamed Alex for not looking for it carefully enough and for jumping to conclusions about me. Next time, don't be so silly. Andrea is a good person. Besides, her family is so wealthy. Why would she need to steal a pen from you? I just smiled and walked away. Suddenly, a voice called out from behind me. It was Scott. He looked at me and said, Wow, that was totally dramatic. I'm Scott, by the way. You're Andrea, right? I'm sorry if this is a bit forward, but here's my number. Excuse me? Am I dreaming? Of course, I texted him as soon as I got home. He said he was so impressed with how I'd handled being blamed for the whole thing. Soon we were chatting every day, and eventually he asked me to be his girlfriend. I was so happy. But there was just one small problem. Ever since we'd started dating, I felt really ashamed about my bad habit of stealing things. I was determined to give it up, but it wasn't going to be easy. One day, Scott came to pick me up and asked if I wanted to go to the bookstore. A bookstore? No, I don't want to go there. Can we go somewhere else? Please? Seeing me panic like that, Scott looked puzzled. Then he suggested we go to his place to watch a movie, which I was fine with. Hopefully there would be no temptations for stealing there. A middle-aged woman opened the door for us at Scott's place. Oh, this is Sandra, our maid. Hi, Sandra. I'm Andrea. But instead of saying hi back, Sandra just stared at me in a seriously creepy way. It actually sent shivers down my spine. After watching the movie, Scott and his mom invited me to stay for dinner. Scott's mother, Mrs. Doris Parker, was really sweet, and we had some interesting chats. While waiting for dessert, I got up to go to the bathroom. But as I stepped out there, I almost bumped into Sandra. She was just standing there staring at me again. Uh, sorry. She didn't say anything, but just kept staring at me in this weird way. Oh my gosh, why was she looking at me like that? The next morning at school, Scott told me his mother had just lost a valuable ring. She had a jewelry tray next to the bathroom sink, and after washing her hands, she'd forgotten to put her ring on. After dinner, the ring was no longer there. I comforted Scott, then made an excuse to go to the ladies' room. I needed to seriously think about this. Honestly, I'd tried my best to not get the urge to steal at Scott's place. But when I'd seen Doris's beautiful ring, no, I had to find a way to return it. No one could find out about this. And I had sworn to myself that I would never let this happen again. Hello, Sam. Huh? Where's Sandra? Oh, she was fired. Mrs. Parker said Sandra had stolen her jewelry. Anyway, may I help you? Oh, no. I had to return this ring immediately. Poor Sandra. Scott came down for me and said he'd make dinner. I glanced through the window to find Doris was having tea in the garden. This was my chance. I snuck up to her room, quietly tiptoed in, and headed towards her jewelry box. Suddenly, the light came on. Tell me what on earth are you doing here? I quickly turned around, dropping the ring to the floor. M Mindy? Why are you here? I'm Scott's cousin. So it was you who stole the ring. I can't believe my cousin is dating you. Hearing the noise, Scott and his mom ran upstairs while I was still dumbfounded and speechless. It was you who stole Cass's necklace too, wasn't it? She won't even speak to me because of you. I'm so sorry. I know it's not okay, but I couldn't stop myself. I've been feeling so guilty, so that's why I'm returning it. I was still kneeling on the ground when a hand reached out to me and helped me stand up. I'll handle this. Come on, let's have a chat outside, shall we? Turns out Mrs. Parker is a therapist. She could see I had a problem and offered to help me. I told her how guilty I'd been feeling about Sandra getting fired and asked Doris if she could call her for me so I could apologize. Thirty minutes later, Sandra arrived. As soon as Doris saw her, she apologized and offered her the job back. But no, no, ma'am, I was the one who stole it, and I deserve to be punished. I'm sorry, Sandra, I've already confessed to Mrs. Parker that I stole the ring. I didn't mean to get you fired. I just couldn't help it. You didn't do anything wrong. I, it was me. I was greedy. She is innocent. 
what on earth is going on? Obviously, I was the thief, so why was she defending me? Why are you doing this? Do we know each other, Sandra? And that's when the truth came pouring out. Sandra was my mom. Yeah, I don't know how this is possible either. So according to her words, she'd had a huge fight with my dad when I was a baby, and she'd fled to another city where she found a job working for Scott's family. When they moved to Seattle, she came with them. Even though she was nervous about returning back to where me and my dad were, she'd carried so much guilt about leaving us, and never in a million years did she expect to bump into me at Scott's house. I was so shocked, I couldn't even speak. I'd imagined this moment my whole life, and now... Here I was, standing face to face with her, and she'd even taken the blame for me. I couldn't believe it. Mom, I'm so sorry that I stole the ring. I, I can't believe you're really here. Sweetie, you don't need to apologize. I'm the one who will be apologizing for the rest of my life, abandoning my daughter like that. What kind of mom am I? How will you ever forgive me? We stood there hugging for what felt like forever, and I knew in that moment that I'd never steal again. Doris diagnosed me as having kleptomania due to a lack of love for my mom, but now that my mom was back, I had no reason to seek out those thrills from stealing. I had everything I needed right here. There were a few moments where I almost stole again, but Doris told me to call my mom as soon as I felt the urge, and when my mom picked up the phone and I heard her voice, the urge faded, and I felt so much better. Scott and Cass and Mindy forgave me after Doris sat them all down and explained more about my addiction and where it stemmed from. Now, Scott and I are still together, and I see my mom every day at Scott's place. My dad hasn't forgiven my mom for leaving yet, but baby steps. Finally, I feel like everything is complete, and my pilfering is a thing of the past. Hi there, I'm Flora, Portside High School cheerleading captain and beauty pageant queen. My natural beauty and charisma mean that everyone's drawn to me, but hey, I don't make it easy for them. I only allow a select few to get close to me as I can't be seen associating with just anyone. Only my classmate Nina is pretty enough to have the coveted position of my BFF. Birds of a feather flock together, right? My high school life was perfect. But then, in the space of one day, that all changed. The principal, Mrs. Harrington, told me that due to my cheerleading abilities, I'd won a scholarship to the ACL Academy, a boarding school for the athletically gifted. And I was leaving today! Huh? This made no sense! I mean, I don't even do sports! I rushed straight home to discuss it with my mom and found her sitting on the couch surrounded by a load of shopping bags. Yep. She'd already spent the scholarship money before I'd even found out the news. I know mom loves money, but how could she make such a huge decision about my life without discussing it with me first? Ugh. Looks like I had no choice but to leave Portside High behind and go to this stupid sports school. Whatever. I'm a skilled cheerleader after all. It'd be a breeze, right? Wrong. This new school sucked. On my very first day here, I was woken up at 6am and forced to run five laps around the stadium. God. Are these people superheroes or what? How are they able to run and laugh at the same time while well, I am panting like crazy? I didn't have time to catch my breath when the teacher made us move to the gym to lift weights. After three hours in the hellish gym, I barely had time to digest my lunch before they steered me into the volleyball court. Yep, that's the sport mom had registered me for. Ugh, this stupid sport. Finally, nighttime arrived, and I managed to crawl my aching body back to my dorm. God save me from this living nightmare! Suddenly, the door opened, and in stepped my three roomies, aka my volleyball teammates. Honestly, I don't even know if I could call them girls or not. One has super short cropped bangs, one doesn't say much and shuffles more than walks, and one wears clothes so baggy they resemble a tent. Obviously, I'm way out of their league. And you know what they all have in common? They're always sweaty. So gross. Come to think of it, I have to go take a shower ASAP. Otherwise, I might turn into one of them. Fresh out of the shower, I called Nina and blurted out how exhausted I was and how much I missed our school. Who are you? You must be so tired. Oh, by the way, I have some amazing news to tell you. There's a city beauty pageant coming up, and I'm representing the school! 
What? But I won the school beauty contest. Yeah, you did. But you don't attend Portside High anymore, so seeing as I came second, they've given me the spot. Too bad, as you definitely would have won. What? How unfair! I was still in shock when the dorm supervisor stormed in and took away my phone. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention. This school even has a strict 10 p.m. phones away and lights off rule. It's all because they believe health is the most precious thing for an athlete. I tossed and turned all night. This beauty pageant was massive, and there's no way I could miss it. But I'm not at Portside High anymore. Instead, I'm stuck in this dumb jock academy. Hmm, if only I could get out of here. Huh, that's right. I have a brilliant idea. I need to get expelled. So, I decided to skip practice and go cause some havoc for three days straight. I poured paint into the pool, cut off the badminton strings, deflated all of the soccer balls, and of course, I made sure that the security cameras caught it all. And as expected, the principal eventually called me into his office. Yes, this was the moment I was waiting for. Soon I could pack and get out of here. Only the rest didn't exactly go to plan. If it had not been for Mrs. Harrington. Two laps of frog jumps around the soccer field, now! What? Frog jumps? I hate those things! Why couldn't he just kick me out already? But wait, what does Mrs. Harrington have to do with this? After my punishment, I needed to vent. So, hugging my aching thighs, I called Nina to complain about my failed plan. And she just burst out laughing. <laughs> oh, Flora, those outdated tricks were never gonna work. You have to do something bold, like... <gasps> oh my god, Nina is a genius! The next night, following Nina's instructions, I sneaked out when everyone was asleep. That's right, I'm going to wake the whole school up with these firecrackers. I lit one in the dorm's backyard, then ran to hide behind the bushes. Three, two, one, and... silence. Huh? I went back to check and saw that it had gone out. What's wrong? Is this one broken? I tried again and again, but the same thing happened each time. As if a ghost did it? Just the thought of it sent chills down my spine, so I sprinted right back to my room. Okay, so not only had my plan been a massive fail, but it had left me super tired. Needless to say, this morning's run was not fun. Zombie alert! Hmm, how come they look even more exhausted than me? Hey, have you guys heard about the doomed jock? He's the ghost in the dorm's backyard. Allegedly, he attended this academy years ago, and he exercised himself to death right there in the dorm's backyard. So now, he haunts it. What was she talking about? Could it be the one who messed with me yesterday? Was the doomed jock? I couldn't just give up like that. I needed to figure out a way to get out of this awful place before this ghost got me. Hmm... How about starting a fight? I heard that the fencing team and basketball team were the two toughest groups in the school. So, I sprayed paint on their fencing masks and punctured all of the basketballs, and left a fencing sword at the scene. Then I wrote both teams an anonymous letter. Sunday, 2 p.m., abandoned building near the back gate. When Sunday came, I hid in the abandoned house and waited for the two groups to arrive. Look at their tense faces, this was gonna be fun! I quickly called the cops, and then took advantage of the chaos to blend in with the feuding teams. I almost got punched in the face when, fortunately, the cops got there just in time, causing everyone to frantically flee the scene. I happily ran to a cop. It's me! I started this fight! But, to my surprise, the cop just asked if I was hurt. Then he hurriedly chased after the gang. Only then I realized that if I wanted to be caught, I had to do exactly what they did run away. Oh, man. I was staggering my way back to the dormitory, feeling deflated, when I spotted the fencing and basketball teams coming my way. Freaked out, I looked around for a place to hide, but there was only one car parked on the side of the road. With no other way, I ventured to open the car door, and, oh, it wasn't locked. I quickly jumped in, hid under the back seat, and lay completely still. At that moment, the car door swung open, I closed my eyes and braced myself to catch some hands when suddenly the car revved up and left. Looking up, 
I saw the principal sitting in the driver's seat, whistling happily. Oh, so it was his car. After a while, the car stopped in front of a bar in town. Didn't expect a serious man like him to go to such places. But wait, an underage student being caught by the principal here would surely get me expelled, right? With that in mind, I hurriedly followed him. But at the door, a security guard stopped me and asked for my ID card. I had no idea what to do when suddenly a strange guy appeared. Hey cutie, need an ID card? How about this? I'll lend you a fake ID to get in. In exchange, you must go out with me tonight. Sounds good, huh? Well, I didn't plan on sticking around for long, as I would just get in, find the principal, and get caught right away anyway, so I nodded in agreement. I was about to take the ID card from him when someone yanked me back and pushed me into a cab. My roommates! What are you doing here? Do you know you've just ruined my plan and- Ruined? Who's the one causing trouble here? Do you honestly believe that if you get expelled like that, your old school will take you back? <sighs> that chance. Huh? How'd you know that I'm trying to get expelled? Turns out my roommates overheard the conversation between me and Nina. It was them who extinguished my firecrackers in the campus backyard, then made up the doomed jock ghost story to make me stay away from there. Then, when the basketball and fencing team searched for me, it was them who lied that I was with them all day so I could get away with it. But what did you do that for? Don't get us wrong, we didn't do it for you. We did it to protect the school's reputation. Then they started telling me that, for the last few years, due to bad achievements, our school was on the chopping block to make space for industrial areas. The only way to convince the city council to keep our school was by winning the state's upcoming sports competition. We've all played sports for all of our lives. Sport is everything to us. If our school closes, we don't know where we'd go. That's why when we saw you being lazy and messing about, we couldn't just sit back and watch. Oh, I had no idea about this. Suddenly, I felt so guilty. I mean, of course I don't want to ruin their futures. I then also opened up to them and told them all about the beauty pageant. They insisted there must be a way to join the pageant without returning to my old school. So they searched around on Google, and guess what? Turns out the pageant accepts free candidates too, which means no school registration needed. What else could I wish for? I immediately signed up for it, and as a thank you to my new friends, I started making an effort at playing volleyball. I'm a tall girl, so my training position is a right side hitter. And you know what? There is this satisfaction whenever I was able to block a ball. Not gonna lie, this is much more interesting than I thought. That weekend, I went to the city to pick out some dresses for the beauty contest. I found myself immersed in racks of gorgeous gowns when a familiar voice startled me. How about this one, Mom? Stunning, sweetie. You're the most beautiful girl in this world. I don't know what possessed them to pick Flora over you. But no need to worry this time, as I have sent her far away. Yeah, that's where she belongs. I'll show them who's the true beauty queen now. What? No way! My old school principal is Nina's mom? And transferring me to the sports academy was part of her plan? just so her daughter could go to the pageant? I was fuming. So as soon as Mrs. Harrington went outside to take a call, I walked straight over to confront Nina. I can't believe you're like that. Nina looked shocked at first, but then smirked as she said, Like what? Like someone who's far prettier, more talented, and crown-worthy than you? Thanks, sporty girl. I shoved past her and stormed out of there. Wait for it, Nina. We'll soon see who the real winner is. The next few weeks were crazy busy with volleyball practice and the pageant preparations. I may have only been a reserve, but I still wanted to give it my all to motivate the team. The sports competition soon arrived, and after two days of competing, the fate of the school came down to the final match. Our volleyball game! Talk about intense! It sucked it was on the same day as the beauty pageant, as I would have loved to be able to cheer them on from the player bench. But then, disaster struck. The girl who plays right side hitter sprained her wrist and couldn't play. The whole team looked so worried and that made my heart ache. There was only one thing for it. I'd replace her. If I was quick, I could still make it to the beauty pageant afterward. Come on, Flora. Stay focused. Just one point left and we'd win. Suddenly, the ball came flying at me. 
this was it. I hit it with all my might and... Score! We won! I was busy celebrating our victory when everyone suddenly asked me about the beauty pageant. Oh my god! I almost forgot! The match went on longer than I thought it would. My friends dragged me into the taxi, but when we got there, the show was already coming to an end. And worst of all, guess who was standing there wearing the winner's crown and looking all smug? Yep, Nina. Did you come to congratulate me? Thanks, bestie. Oh, you guys must be Flora's new friends. Hmm, that figures. How cute. Stop the act, Nina. Yes, they are my friends. They're not fake, and they're a thousand times more interesting than you. <laughs> Say whatever you want, but I'm a beauty queen now, and you're no longer at the same level as me. My friends started clenching their fists, so I quickly pulled them away before anything happened. Right at that time, an announcement came across the speaker. Attention, pageants. We've just discovered signs of voter fraud. Please stay inside the hall and await further confirmation. About 30 minutes later, the truth finally came out. Turns out, Nina's mom had paid for the voting texts. Needless to say, Nina had her crown taken off her immediately, and Mrs. Harrington also lost her principal job. <laughs> what goes around comes around, right? As for me, I'm not bothered about beauty pageants anymore. Instead, I have a new hobby, volleyball. Turns out I'm pretty good at it, and who knows, I might even become a professional player? And you know what the best part of all this is? I now have true friends by my side who I know will be willing to help me anytime and anywhere. I can't believe I'm standing here in the middle of this frenzied concert with a crowd of crazy fans cheering for this Isaac guy, who I don't even care about. Hi. I'm Hazel, by the way. When I agreed with my friends to go on this road trip all the way to Carolina to attend a skydiving festival, well, this wasn't exactly what I was expecting. Yeah, that's them, Ivy and Zoe, the girls who tricked me into thinking this, their idols concert, was the opening of the festival. There I was, eagerly awaiting some amazing aerial display or something, but instead, I was stuck in Fanville. Ugh. Why were they so loud? My hearing better not be permanently damaged from this. And as you can see, being the only calm one here, they placed me in charge of their fan cams. Worse still, why did I specifically order these custom matching hoodies for us all? It made me look like I was part of these groupies. Finally, this din was over, but I was stuck amongst the slow walking fans. And where were my friends? I couldn't even call them as my battery had died. Hmm, I'll just get a taxi back to our Airbnb rental, then contact them from there. I'm too exhausted anyway. Let's just get out of this place ASAP, forget about this chaotic night, as I'll be having a bird's eye view of the world at the actual Fall Fest tomorrow, and that's all that matters. Wow, this festival had everything going for it, from attentive service, amazing live music, and great food. It was so worth enduring that awful concert for. Everything was going great, until I saw Ivy's panicked face. Girls, it's our beloved Isaac. After the concert last night, he disappeared with a mysterious girl. Look at this hoodie. Does it seem familiar to you? Oh my god, that's one of our custom-made group hoodies. Could it be? I could clearly see Zoe's suspicious gaze on me and Ivy. What's that look for? Are you suspecting me? Well, whatever. It wasn't me, that's for sure. Ivy, you took way too long to get back to the car last night. As for you, Hazel, you were unreachable for ages. Jeez, my battery died. I told you both this. And I have nothing to do with your precious idol. Besides, if any of us did run away with him, then we'd hardly be standing here, would we? Anyway, you two can stay here and doubt each other if you want, but I'm going skydiving. Then I stormed off. It's so frustrating that I've been dragged into this. My phone only died thanks to their stupid fan cams. That's enough. <sighs> Let's just forget about it. I won't let anything ruin this moment. Guys, look! 
I'm amongst the clouds! 10,000 feet above the ground and my breath is literally taken away! No matter how many times I've done this, it still feels just as thrilling as the first time! This adrenaline rush was crazy! Whoa, that was amazing! Thank goodness I managed to capture some spectacular footage of the beautiful city of Chester. Hang on. When I was close to landing, my camera spotted a familiar face. Zoe. Um, wasn't she meant to be preparing to fly? So why was she talking to someone in the parking lot? It was really weird. Looking closer, the strange man was... Isaac. The missing singer! I didn't see it wrong, did I? I immediately called Ivy and we quickly ran to the parking lot. Gotcha! You better have a good reason for this. Isaac? Are you really... So, you're the one who ran away with him last night? Zoe couldn't say a word at that point and kept trying to avoid eye contact with us. But eventually, under the harsh questioning from Ivy, she found her voice and told us everything. So, last night, when we were separated in the after-concert chaos, Zoe was trying to find us when she accidentally bumped into a guy in disguise. Guess what? Yep, it was none other than Isaac McGuire in the flesh. She almost screamed out his name, so he immediately covered her mouth and dragged her away. Realizing that Isaac was being chased, Zoe then put her hood up to cover her face and followed him without a question. This hectic schedule was just too much. I can't even remember the last time I had proper time for myself anymore. I need a break. Ugh, and I didn't care. But Ivy sure looked like she was going to drop a tear for her poor idol any second now. Well, you see? It's an emergency. I couldn't help but give him a hand. Then, we've already parted ways last night, but... But my manager has been able to track me down, so we had to run away ASAP. All I have with me is this phone, so I really need your help. And that's when we start to hear some whispers. Someone seemed to have recognized Isaac, so without delay, we immediately jumped into the car. But, huh? Who on earth was sitting next to me? Jeez, this girl's makeup was so flashy, and her perfume was so strong it made my throat lump up. Siren! You're Siren, aren't you? Oh, I adore your chemistry with Isaac in the movie. It's like you guys were born for each other. But, wait, are you two running away together? It turned out that the flamboyant girl was Siren, an emerging actress who was filming a movie with Isaac. Looking at the way she blushed while Isaac remained silent and didn't deny it, it was clear that they were a couple who took their romance off screen. Hmm, busy schedule? Exhausted? Nonsense. Obviously, he was just making excuses to spend time with his girlfriend. Oh my, you're even more beautiful in real life. Your face is a gift from heaven. OMG, Ivy needed to stop. Looking at Siren's smug face, she was clearly big-headed enough without any more flattery. But nope, Ivy continued gushing out a river of compliments at her. I mean, does she seriously like this actress that much? Um, your nose is so pretty from up close. Where'd you get your nose job? Hearing that, Siren immediately stopped smiling and covered her nose in annoyance, which almost made me burst out laughing. Chin shaving surgery, lip filler, nose job. How can she even act with such a stiff face? Sorry to bother everyone, but staying at a hotel is not a good idea right now. Can you guys help us find alternative accommodation? Yes, yes, yes. I volunteer to help you two. I watched in disgust as Ivy and Zoe frantically called and texted their acquaintances, but no one could help. Suddenly, Ivy turned to me and gave me her puppy dog eyes look. Hazel, you're our last hope. You must help us, please. Oh, not that again. Ivy knows I can't say no to her when she makes that pleading face. Okay, fine. Even though I didn't want to, I agreed to let them come to my family's suburban house for a few days. It'll only be a few days. I didn't want any of my family members to know I'd been there. Wow, I can't believe I hadn't been here in 10 years! This place held some of my childhood's good memories, but also some not-so-good ones. Especially one haunting one. <sighs> um, 
why didn't you tell us that your family is loaded? It would be so nice to live in a huge mansion like this. But it seems like your family doesn't come here often. It's so cold and cheerless. Yeah, he's right. Ever since that day, this place was never a home to me anymore, but just a hollow house of gloom. I was still lost in my thoughts when a deafening sound of something breaking came from upstairs. We all rushed upstairs to see what all the noise was about, and found Siren standing there in my parents' bedroom, a broken vase at her feet, and worse still, she was wearing my mom's dress. Take it off right now! Siren just shrugged, stepped over the broken vase pieces, then strutted across the room, and even stopped to pose at the end. Poof! It's just an old dress. Why so serious? I was so furious that on her walk back, I tripped her up, causing her to fall flat on the floor. Isaac hurriedly helped her up, and she hid behind his back and did her whole crocodile tears act, saying I was picking on her. Oh, please. I'd had quite enough of this drama queen for one day, so I was about to lunge at her to teach her a lesson, but Isaac blocked me. Excuse, Siren. That was immature of her, but I suggest you should calm down first. That's right, Hazel. The two of them didn't bring any personal belongings. Anyway, Siren was just a bit careless. You'd better watch your girlfriend closely. Change your clothes. Never touch my mom's stuff again. Got it? Now I'll arrange the rooms for all of us. Well, there were only two usable bedrooms here, since most of them were dusty and unfurnished. So I took the couch and gave one room to my friends, and the other room to the loving couple. But as Siren gave a satisfied look and took Isaac's hand to lead him to their room, he just shook her away and said I could have the bed, and he'd take the couch. No, the couch is mine! I didn't want to share a bed with her! But Isaac ignored my protests and plopped down onto the couch to claim it. Zoe and Ivy quickly scurried upstairs. They caused this mess, yet it's clear neither of them was bold enough to share a room with Siren. What a bunch of annoying, obnoxious celebs. Anyway, I was exhausted. It was time for me to hit the sack. That girl better not snore. Siren started playing some dumb white noises, then instantly fell asleep. Me, on the other hand, even after turning off that weird lullaby of hers, I kept on tossing and turning. Ugh! It was no use. Sleep wasn't happening. So I left the room to get some air. I was about to go downstairs to get some water when I heard a piano playing. Oh, heart and soul. It had been so long since I'd heard these beautiful melodies. The music carried me to a room where the silhouettes of a man passionately playing the piano came into sight. Oh, memories. I loved nothing more than sitting next to my dad and playing happy songs with him. But then, everything fell apart. And I hadn't touched the piano since, well... <sighs> Until today, I sat down next to him and let my fingers glide over the keys. I was immersed in the harmonious melodies of the music and let the notes take me back to the past. Until a scream snapped me out of it. What on earth are you two doing?! Hey guys, I want to tell you about my most memorable summer. It involves a parent-free house, the girl of my dreams, and my little bro Silas's massive secret. Actually, Silas doesn't want me telling you about it, but this story is too fun to keep it for ourselves. So stay tuned, let me tell you what happened. Imagine the scene. I'm there eating corn dogs when my parents announce they're going away on vacation for their 20th wedding anniversary. That means I'll be home alone all week long in our big farmhouse surrounded by vast fields. Sounds great, right? But wait, it got even better when my childhood friends who had now lived in another city were also back in town for the summer vacation. Of course, my parents let me invite them over to stay while they're away. That's how close our families were. Oh God, I haven't seen Carl in over a year and his sister Ellie too. Yep. I wouldn't say that I had the biggest crush on my best friend's sister, but there's that. Anyway, this was going to be my summer paradise. But you know, man proposes, God disposes. It turns out my parents weren't taking Silas with them, because they thought I was old enough to look after my little brother. 
Ugh, what a bummer. How was I meant to impress Ellie when I had a whining kid to care for? I needed to think fast. So as soon as we waved our parents off, I passed my PS4 to him and said, Silas, you can play on it, but only if you promise to do as I ask and stay out of my way. Of course, he agreed. I mean, what eight-year-old boy wouldn't want to play Fortnite? I checked on him now and then and gave him juice and snacks. Other than that, I had plenty of time to spend hanging out with Carl and Ellie. Things were going well for the first few days, and nothing beats being around your best bud and your crush all day long. Whoa, <laughs> just, I just couldn't take my eyes off Ellie. She seemed to have gotten even more beautiful. Then, on one evening, we were sitting outside, stargazing. It was so romantic, especially when Carl thought it was dull and left us to go to bed first. I was about to do the whole yawn and stretch out my arm to wrap around her shoulders trick when Silas appeared and squeezed in between us. I glared at him and through gritted teeth asked him what he wanted. He just shrugged and said, Edward, I'm bored of that game now. I want ice cream. Ellie laughed, then led him off to get some. What? How dare that little dweeb ruin my smooth moves? What a buzzkill! I needed to come up with a new trick to handle this annoying kid. So, the next morning, I told Silas that if he wanted to download a new game of his choice, he needed to go into the field and find a corn cob with exactly 200 seeds on it. He looked like he was going to cry, but he went off to the field. Oh, how smart I am, sending my little brother on a wild goose chase. I expected him to give up after a few hours, but nope. He was out there searching for it all day. He even managed to drag Carl along to help him. In the end, he still had to leave empty-handed. Anyway, I have to thank my stupid brother for helping me to have such a good afternoon with Ellie. That night, we all sat together in the living room and told creepy ghost stories. I hoped Ellie would freak out so much she nestled into my lap for protection. So I told them about the empty house up the road, which was also our family's property. My grandparents used to live there, but now it had been abandoned for over 40 years. There were plenty of rumors about it being haunted. One farmer said he saw a ghostly woman by the window but she vanished into thin air. And someone else said they saw a spooky figure float out of the house and chase after them. Ellie chuckled then said, Ooh, spooky. We should go and check it out. What? This wasn't what I had in mind. In fact, she didn't seem afraid at all. I didn't want to go in there. It was old and creepy and just thinking about it freaked me out. Luckily for me, Silas strongly discouraged us by saying that he had heard someone crying in that house and our parents didn't allow us to go there. And then, from nowhere, I felt the chilly wind blow over me with a whistle, which made my hair stand on end. And boom! The lights went out, leaving the whole room in darkness. Everyone was confused. What on earth was going on? I didn't want to die now. Not when I haven't even told my crush my feelings yet. I was lost in terrifying thoughts when the lights came back on, and everyone else immediately bursted out laughing. OMG. I found myself sitting on Ellie's lap with my head between my hands. It turns out that my evil little brother was the one who turned the lights off as a prank. How humiliating. Oh well, at least Ellie changed her mind about wanting to check the house out. But then, over the next few days, weird things started happening. I went to grab a snack for my secret loot under my bed, but what's this? All of the Snickers bars had gone. It couldn't have been Silas, as he hated Snickers bars, right? Then we were watching a movie. Ellie started shivering, so being the awesome guy I am... I went to get a blanket for her, but... Huh? All of the blankets had gone? When I went back and told Carl and Ellie about it, Ellie said that was odd, as the other day she couldn't find her pajamas, and Carl's pack of Gatorade had vanished too. So, is there a real ghost in my house? As for my bro, he was acting like he was haunted. He barely talked anymore, and for three days in a row, at 6 p.m. on the dot, he disappeared out of the house for hours. This was so strange, I mean, that's the time slot for his favorite show, and he seriously wouldn't miss Adventure Time without a good reason. For me, it's great that Silas isn't at home, but since I'm the older brother, I still have to keep an eye on him, as mom and dad wouldn't have been best impressed if I'd lost him or something. That night, he mysteriously disappeared again. I was quite curious, so I went to look for Silas, but couldn't find him anywhere. Panicked, I raced around the garden calling out his name. Finally. I felt a hand pounding on my shoulder. My heart was in my mouth. I turned around to see Silas standing there sweating. I shouted at him, You can't just run off without saying a word! Where have you been? But Silas calmly replied, So what? It's my business, not yours. Then he ran straight inside. He gotta be kidding me! 
Okay, then if secrecy was the game he wanted to play, then I wouldn't mind being the detective either. I had to figure this out. So I gathered Ellie and Carl and came up with a genius plan. The next day at lunch, as planned, Silas entered the kitchen and everything was set. I placed an eye-catching candy-filled jar on the table. And as expected, Silas immediately picked up a handful and put them right in his mouth. Oh, just look at his happy face. He had no idea what I had in store for him. Right after that, we entered the room. Not wanting to get caught eating food on the sly, Silas quickly hid under the table. And of course, we pretended not to know he was there. Then I held up that candy jar and said, Guys, guess what? I've ordered these pills online. It's the legendary invisible candy that makes it impossible for people to see me. Carl acted surprised. Unbelievable! How did you get this? I heard it's such a hit that it was sold out everywhere. Then Ellie asked me how long we could disappear if we ate these candies. I replied, I think if we just eat four to five candies, we can disappear for 45 minutes. We continued our skit. Then I said I had to leave the candy jar here. So tomorrow we can try it and go out pranking everyone with our new superpower. I winked and everyone nodded. Now, where did Silas go again? I asked, and everyone shook their heads. Then I picked up an apple and purposely dropped it on the floor, then immediately peered underneath the table to look for it while pretending not to see Silas down there. He looked absolutely amazed, trying not to make any sound. Now Silas thought he was truly invisible. He crawled out then did all sorts of funny things in front of us, from dancing, shaking his butt, and cartwheeling across the room. It was so hard to keep a straight face and ignore his existence. Then. At 6 p.m., Silas left the house with a backpack on. But because he thought he was invisible, he ran straight past us without hesitation and didn't forget to stick his tongue out at me before leaving. Hmm, <laughs> this idiot. We followed him, and guess what? He went to the abandoned house. We hid behind a tree to watch, and suddenly the door creaked open. I was a little creeped out, so I clung to Ellie's arm. Someone ran over to him. A little girl. Oh no, was it a, g a, g a ghost? Ellie said, OMG, she's in my clothes. I looked closer and realized she wasn't a ghost, but in fact, was a real life girl. So Silas hid that little girl in our abandoned house. And that's why he kept telling us over and over again not to come here. Since Silas thought that he was invisible, he kept running around her saying, you can't see me, right? He looked so funny as the little girl was too bewildered to understand anything. And right then we barged in shouting, gotcha. Well, well, well. Look who's the big guy hiding his girlfriend here. I pulled out Silas's backpack, which was filled with Snickers bars and other missing items. Silas was shocked and sputtered, I, it's, uh, it's not what you think. The little girl burst into tears and said, I'm Sally. I got lost, so Silas helped me. Silas said that he had met Sally one day on the cornfield. She was alone and hungry, so he brought her here and took care of her. He didn't dare tell us because he was afraid that we would make fun of him. Oh, I didn't think that my usual foolish brother was able to do such a good thing. So I hugged them and said, I don't blame anyone, Silas. You did a very good job. And Sally, you will be safe here. Take her to our house and I will call someone for help. Fortunately, the police said that they were also looking for a missing child. And the next day, Sally was reunited with her parents. It turned out she was at a crowded train station when she ended up lost. Confused, she followed a man with the same shirt as her father, and that's how she ended up lost in our fields. Yeah, my brother is a bit annoying at times, but he's a good kid with a kind heart. Since then, we've grown closer. Hi everyone, Jack here. I'm 17 and I live with my mom, dad, and sis. We're pretty much a normal family. I suppose I do okay at school. I'm not super popular or anything, as I am a little on the shy side, but I'm not unpopular either. I'm really good at sports studies, and I definitely want to pursue this further when I go to college and stuff. Anyway, I want to tell you about my best friend Danny, and the girl of my dreams, Amy. I first met Danny at the age of 10. We were both at the local pool, and back then, I was energetic, and well, I did a lot of stuff without thinking it through. I started splashing about in the pool, and soon I realized I couldn't put my feet on the ground. I couldn't swim. So, yeah, this was bad. I began to panic and tried shouting out for help, but a load of water ended up in my mouth. Then Danny appeared and helped me over to the shallow end. Turns out he was new to town and was starting at the same school that I went to. After that, we became best friends. 
Danny's this effortlessly cool, stylish, and handsome guy. He was always more popular than me, and all the girls liked him, but still, he chose to be friends with me. Being around him was great fun. We hung out and goofed around. There's this girl from school called Amy. She's popular and beautiful. She always wears these pretty dresses, and well, she just stands out. Problem is, I wasn't the only one to notice this. Practically every boy at school had a crush on her. I didn't think I stood a chance with her, but then the school picnic happened. I ended up in the same group as her, so I went over to her and tried to talk. I felt so nervous that I couldn't get any words out. Then I tripped over a branch and accidentally fell into her arms. In that moment, I imagined we looked into each other's eyes and she could see how much I liked her. Then we'd kiss and date and marry and live happily ever after. But yeah, that wasn't reality. In real life, I was stiff as a log and was so embarrassed. I quickly snapped out of it, got up and muttered out, sorry. She giggled and said, no problem. I hope you didn't hurt yourself. Amazingly, we started chatting after that. Things quickly changed between Amy and me. We talked a lot on Messenger, and I often sat with her at lunch. She was so fun to be around, and I loved spending time with her. Then we started dating. I often had to pinch myself to convince myself that yes, I really was dating the most beautiful girl in school. We both loved nature, so we often spent our weekends going for walks and exploring new places. Our first kiss happened in my room. We were meant to be working on our science project, but I couldn't stop staring at her. She was just so beautiful. So I leaned over and kissed her. It was like fireworks were going off around us. <laughs> Talk about magical. After that, we became pretty much inseparable. I often went out to restaurants with her family, and she regularly came over for dinner with mine. Things were amazing. She was my princess. With her around, I felt so happy, and I couldn't imagine my life without her in it. Then one night, she texted me, I love you. This made me smile, and I sent back, I love you too, Amy. Then, to my surprise, she messaged back, What is love anyway? I didn't understand what she meant, but before I can send another message asking this, she sent me a video of her with Danny, my best friend Danny. Then she messaged me, This is what real love looks like. Couldn't believe what I just saw. I immediately threw my phone across the room. I was so heartbroken. How could she do this to me and with my best friend? I cried days and nights. It was horrible. I felt like I'd never be happy again. I rarely cry, so my family was really worried and tried every way to console me, but nothing they said or did could cheer me up. Worse still, I was dreading going back to school and having to see them together. They didn't make it easy for me. As soon as I got to my locker, I saw them there, kissing. Word got around that they were very much in love. So much for her ever loving me. It hurt so much. Danny didn't seem to bother that he'd hurt me. That's the problem with Danny. He doesn't think sometimes. He just goes after what he wants without a care for who he stomps on in the process. Plus, we weren't as close as before anymore. Ever since high school started, he'd been hanging out with some bad guy. I told him that Amy was a liar and that she would soon go off him. But he just shrugged and said, Whatever. I know you're probably wondering why I stayed friends with Danny after what he did. I guess I'm too nice, but I just couldn't break our seven-year relationship over this. It was bad enough I'd lost the love of my life. I couldn't afford to lose my best friend too. Yes, I felt betrayed and angry, but Amy had made her choice, and it wasn't me. Then one night, I was on my way home on the metro. The only free seat was next to Amy, so I sat down next to her. At first, it was awkward, and neither of us spoke. Then I asked her, why did you cheat on me? She replied, well, Danny's the richest, most popular, and best looking guy in school. I only used you to get closer to him. This was horrible to hear. I was so mad that I chose to stand for the rest of the journey back. The next day, I tried telling Danny what Amy had said. He told me I was just being jealous, shoved me, and yelled at me that I needed to stop being so bitter. We didn't talk for two weeks after that. I felt so lonely, but it turns out neither Danny nor Amy were the people I thought they were. Danny tried calling, but I ignored his calls. He also sent me some lame apology messages, but I didn't reply. Then one day, he showed up on my doorstep, gave me chocolate, and asked me to go for a walk in the woods with him. I took my GoPro with me. As I said before, I love nature. I always film the scenery on my walks. I asked him if he truly loved Amy, and to my surprise, 
He said that girls were like chewing gum. You had to chew till the end and then spit them out. He said he would use Amy one last time, then finish with her, then let his friends have her. Then he would move to another city and do it all over again. This was shocking to hear. I knew he could be reckless, but I didn't think the boy who saved my life when we were 10 was capable of being so cruel. I told him I never wanted to talk to him again, and I stormed off. My GoPro had been recording the whole time. So it was about time I took revenge on my shattered heart, wasn't it? Thing is, as mean as Amy has been, I still care about her. I thought about it a lot and eventually decided that she deserved to know the truth. So I sent her the recording. Even after seeing it, she made out I'd edited it to make Danny sound bad, as I was just jealous. I knew that her parents thought she was so sweet and innocent, so I told her that if she didn't split up with Danny, I'd send them the video clip. She tried to resist at first, but soon she gave up and begged me not to show it to them. I later found out that she'd continued to see Danny in secret for weeks after that. But eventually, she saw the dark side to him. She even came up to me at school and thanked me for trying to help her and apologized for hurting me. I didn't try to save her from Danny because I was feeling sympathetic toward her or anything like that. Instead, I believe that witnessing a crime is as bad as committing it. I guess that as mean as Amy had been to me, I didn't want to see her hurt, especially not by that jerk. Actually, after that, she's even reached out to me once and asked me to be her boyfriend again. But of course, I wasn't a fool. A leopard can't change its spots. So I made it clear to her that my answer was and would always be no, and that we should just stay friends. While me and Danny, we aren't friends anymore. I have other friends, but it's hard, as a part of me does still miss him, but I don't like the person he's become. Thanks for listening to my story. I hope that you guys don't go through what I did, but if you do, I hope you find the strength to do the right thing, however hard this may be. Finally, my first day at school has come. Yay! This special occasion called for my favorite hoodie. Super cool, right? <laughs> but then, out of nowhere, I was blocked by a group of boys and their cheesy pickup lines. No time for monkey business, but they wouldn't let me go. Hey, do you know who I am? I'm... Everything suddenly went blurry. Oh no, my glasses! I stumbled around trying to grab them back, but got shoved to the floor. Everyone scram. Give me that. I looked up and vaguely saw my hero offering me a hand. He gave me my glasses and I profusely thanked him. But he just gave me a cold look and walked off without saying a word. Strange. Oh, by the way, I'm Hazel Palmer, 17 years old. But I'm not here as a student, but a teacher. Yes, you heard it right. Not to brag, but I'm kind of a genius. <laughs> I even got offered a position in my college's research project, which I have rejected to pursue my dream of becoming a high school teacher. So here I am on my very first day of fulfilling it. First, I was introduced to the other teachers, but unlike what I had in mind, they just threw me judgy looks. Luckily, after the meeting, a young teacher named Rebecca kindly welcomed me and even tipped me off about some of the rebels at school. Now time to meet my students. As soon as I finished my introduction, the whole class immediately turned into a beehive. Miss, how about we continue this lesson at the movies tonight? Mullet, Pierce nose. This guy must be the notorious Lucas that Rebecca warned me about. Please, as if you'd date someone who would wear such a goofy hoodie. Yeah, who let a weeaboo teach here? Jeez, I didn't expect this reaction. I tried to restore the silence, but to no avail. Ugh, I'm out of patience. Quiet, or else you'll all get F's. Thank God it worked. Whew, that'll show them who's in charge. But here comes another problem. No way! There's gotta be someone who's really here to study, right? Okay, who is our class's top student? Ethan! Ah, didn't he help me in the hallway? But it looked like he didn't recognize me. Okay, let's see. Ethan, right? Could you solve this equation? A equation? N no, equation. I suppose spelling is a bit hard for a numbers person like you. And the whole class burst into laughter. Jeez, this guy was unbelievable. Hmm, 
How about the second best student? Cassie Santago? That name sounded just like my old classmates. I turned to the corner where an arm reluctantly raised. Oh my, it's her! So good to see a familiar face here. But why is she avoiding me? That afternoon, while walking to my car, I saw Cassie and her friends picking on a girl. Upon seeing me, they immediately ran away, but I managed to catch Cassie. Cassie, since when did you become a mean girl? None of your business. Report me to the principal if you like. Then she strutted away, leaving me standing there confused. Since when had the sweet Cassie ended up on the dark side? Turned out, not long ago, Cassie's father passed away in an accident, leaving her to live with her stepmother. This must left her in so much grief that she put up this cold, reckless facade as a defense mechanism. That's so sad. So, to make Cassie feel included, and also to improve this whole class's performance, I came up with a master plan. More homework! Not finished? Minus points. And every lesson will come with a gift. A test during recess, and I asked Cassie and Ethan to help the other students. But when I called Cassie to the board, strangely, she couldn't do a simple equation. At first, I thought that it was just her being rebellious, but during the test that day, I noticed her copying Ethan's answers. Does that mean all her A's were from cheating? Not only that, the even shocker thing I found out was that Ethan was her stepbrother! After class, I came to talk to her, but she didn't pay me any attention. Cassie, I know the secret behind your A's. High scores mean nothing when they're not from your own hard work. But out of my business. <laughs> You're as much my friend as you are a proper teacher. I'd be pleased to tutor you. How about today? See you in the library after school. As if I care. Her words did hurt, but I guess she was just trying to keep her cold image. So I still waited for her, but she never showed up. No matter how much I tried, Cassie ignored me and kept cheating. During the midterm test, she even blatantly snatched Ethan's paper. It's true she's my friend, but I couldn't let it slide any longer, so I dismissed her test. That had to be done. <sighs> On the same day, while I was in the library searching for materials, I heard familiar voices talking. Ms. Palmer is way too much. She even dismissed Cassie's test today. Can you believe this? Why can't she be understanding like you? Cut her some slack, Sadie. She's just doing what she thinks is best. So that's what my students really thought of me? After everything I did to try and help them, yet all I got back was bad-mouthing? And Rebecca was so nice to defend me like that. No wonder they liked her. <sighs> a few days later, the unexpected happened. Cassie, Lucas, and a few others came and asked for extra lessons. Finally, they started to have another eye on studying. But little did I know that it's just a ruse from my dear students to turn the following days into a nightmare. And the instigator was Lucas, I supposed. One day, I almost fainted upon finding a huge ant nest inside my bag. The other day, my pants were stuck to the chair with some gum. <sighs> Fortunately, Ethan always showed up in time to help me. He's such a riddle. Unlike before, not only did he try to defend me in class, but he also helped me carry my textbooks. But I didn't expect him to care that much. One time, I saw him at the car wash where I worked part-time. I quickly hid behind a car, but Ethan just kept walking towards my wash box. I'm here to see you, so no need to hide. Let me give you a hand. After my shift, Ethan took me home. We talked a lot, and I felt comfortable enough to tell him about my mom's health condition and how I took this part-time job to cover her hospital fee. This side of him was far different from the normal, and it was heartwarming. Suddenly, we noticed an elderly lady who seemed lost, so we offered to take her home. And guess what? She's the grandma of the notorious Lucas. I was truly surprised by how much of a rebel like Lucas cared for his Nana. I could tell he really loved her a lot. Poor boy. She's the only family he got now. Lucas, I know studying is not your thing, but have you thought about how happy your grandma would be if you at least tried? Since then, Lucas stopped causing me any mischief, and so did the other students. Now they could even do simple math themselves. Baby steps. <laughs> Seeing my effort finally bore fruit, I set up a parent meeting to report students' progress. Halfway through my presentation, a photo of me cosplaying as Sailor Moon popped up on the screen. Oh my god, why is it here? How dare you let this childish thing teach my kids? Then she stormed off, followed by everyone else. I thought I finally had my students on my side. Turns out I never did. Then came the last straw, my mom's medical test results. I couldn't help but cry, letting all my bottled up emotions out. Then suddenly a hand laid on my shoulder. What's wrong? My mom's health turned worse and she needs an urgent operation. I'm sorry to hear that. It's all gonna be okay. 
Be strong, Miss Palmer. I appreciated him comforting me, and when I felt a bit better, we decided to leave. But the door was locked from the outside. It must have been a prank from my students. Again! We tried banging the door and screaming for help, but eventually gave up and waited for someone to come. This quiet atmosphere sure does have a way of making people open up, and I got to know about Ethan. Seemed like both of us have problems with our beloved family. What's yours? I... I have a sister. You know who. That I really adore. But no matter how hard I try, she always builds a wall between us. Oh, wasn't this the first time Ethan talked about his personal life? He always put on a cold and distant mask. But I knew deep down he had his struggles too. I was so absorbed in his story that I forgot about being locked up and gradually fell asleep until a buzzing sound startled me and countless phone cameras were pointing at us. Guys, check your phones. Look what Miss Palmer and Ethan have been doing this whole time. Oh my! A bunch of photos of me and Ethan have been uploaded on the school website and from some angles, it looked like we were kissing. <gasps> oh no! I tried to explain but they just threw me a disgusted look. And why was Ethan just standing here saying nothing? This soon reached the principal. He told me there would be a case hearing for inappropriate relationship with a student. How was this even possible? As I dragged my feet to the principal's office, suddenly I heard familiar voices shouting. Why did you do that? I told you to find her weakness and look what you got. Nothing. I've done everything I could. What else do you want? Everything? Then why is she still here? As long as she's around, she messes up our cheating stuff, and mom will get my head shoot off for being useless at school. Or is that what you want, brother? What? <gasps> so, Cassie had been pulling the strings this entire time? And Ethan was her puppet, befriending me just to please his sister. I knew she hated me, but did Ethan have to be so heartless too? Cassie then caught my eye, so I ran away. I was still trying to process this when I walked in to see the school council glaring at me. You're an insult to the teaching profession which leaves us no choice. I was ready for the worst when Ethan rushed in. Stop, it was me who deliberately jammed the classroom's lock to get back at her for being too strict, but I accidentally got stuck too. There's nothing going on between us. And so I was cleared of all charges and Ethan ended up in a week long suspension. Why did he do that after all? After such a long trial, I drove around town to blow off some steam, then saw Cassie fighting with a security guard. I found out that Cassie stole a bracelet and was refusing to call her parents. The guard said he'd have to call the cops, so I came forward as her teacher to bail her out. Cassie asked me why I helped her, but I didn't bother explaining myself and just left. Since that day, Cassie didn't attend the extra classes. After his suspension, Ethan returned with his offhand attitude. <sighs> no time to worry about those two. My mission now was to prepare my students for the upcoming finals and regain my prestige. Luckily, they started to take studying seriously and invested a lot in these tests. One day, when I walked into class, some students even asked me to help solve advanced exercises. Two weeks later, when the results came, my excited students all rushed over to me. Miss Palmer, thanks to you, the questions were the same as the ones you showed us the other day, so it only took us a blink to finish. What are they talking about? Before I could understand, the principal summoned me to his office. As I entered, he angrily showed me the math sheet that I was allegedly teaching in the extra class. What kind of work ethic allows leaking exam questions, Miss Palmer? Leak the test? <gasps> me? No! Please! No more excuses. You're fired! No, no! They can't punish me for something I didn't do! Someone must have framed me! I asked my students where they got that piece of paper and they said it was already on the table when they came to class. So Cassie and Ethan must have been behind this. Good job, Ethan, for putting up their remorse act just to set up a bigger plan to humiliate me. Okay then, they won. Unemployed and desperate, with hospital bills to cover, I had to work full time at the car wash, as well as taking night shifts at 7-Eleven. But besides the measly wages was a bonus of rotten eggs and tomatoes, scornful looks and snarky comments saying I didn't deserve the teacher title. <sighs> The scandal truly turned my life upside down. Then, when I was at the hospital with my mom, suddenly Ethan rushed in and said he would clear my name. Clear my name? Wasn't he the one who put dirt on me? What was he playing this time? With nothing to lose, I reluctantly went with him. He led me to the school's control room. The principal was also there. Then I saw Sadie standing on stage. 
Ethan said it was her who discreetly put the math sheet on the table. What? But, Rebecca? I distributed the test like you said, but I'm scared. What if someone finds out? Don't worry, now that Miss Palmer's fired, who else can dig this up? I'm only taking back my position as the beloved teacher who can take cover for y'all. No, I have to tell the principal everything. Who would believe you? I would. Furious, I rushed over to the stage and confronted her. Rebecca, I thought you were my friend. How could you? Don't ask me. Ask your phony self. Weren't you just trying to get the students to like you? What nonsense was she saying? I'm just doing my part of being a good teacher. How could she be so selfish and cruel? Out of jealousy? Miss Palmer earned her students' respect with her pure heart. Look at you. The so-called love you have comes from buttering them up with all your lies. That's why they turn stubborn and make light of studying. I never knew you were that kind of person. How could you call yourself a teacher? The principal couldn't hide his rage, fired Rebecca, then apologized to me and offered me my job back. But after all these troubles, this school had completely drained me. I couldn't take it anymore, so I refused. As I was wiping away my tears, Ethan came to my side. Miss Palmer, I'm sorry for everything I did. I just tried to please Cassie, but now I know I was only hurting you. I've already known about that. I was about to leave when a group of students led by Cassie approached us. Then Ethan told me it was Cassie who helped him with the plan to bait Rebecca into admitting her actions. Sorry for all the horrible things I did to you. Please stay. We've learned a lot since you moved here. Please don't leave us. Such a crazy term. I ended up staying. I mean, this is my dream job after all, and I'm not one to give up that easily. I also talked to Cassie's stepmom about her studying. Turns out, she didn't realize her strict approach was causing a rift between them all. Cassie, Ethan, and their mom had a talk, and now they seem to understand each other better. I was so happy for them, and we became friends after that. Time flies, and now my students, or my friends, to be correct, graduated, and would soon fly off to pursue their own dreams. Suddenly, Ethan dragged me to a corner. So from now on, we're no longer teacher and student, right? I guess, but so... But could you still teach me? Teach me how to love you. I was grabbing a book out of my locker when some guy's shout startled me. Hey everyone, the results are over here! Oh, <laughs> it's just the results of the Mind Buzz, our annual high school general knowledge competition. People, what's the rush? Don't we all know what it'll be like already? See, nothing's changed. That's my name, there, the first place of Willowmere High, as always. And of course, what came along with it were endless praises from everyone. Way to go, Millie, you're our school superhero. Oh my gosh, you're amazing, I'm so jealous of you. Yep. Hi, I'm Millie, the girl who always aces every school contest and is therefore adored by the other students all the teachers, and the principal. Later that day, as soon as I stepped out of art class, Alice, my excitable best friend, jumped out of nowhere and squealed out, I just found this really cool place. We have to go there right now. No chance. I have the final round of the blast from the past contest tomorrow. I mean, history is my forte, so I'm sure to win, but I still want to cram in some last minute studying. Come on, we all know you'll win anyway. You even said that yourself. So let's just hang out for a little, please? Fine, but only because I'm an amazing friend. Hmm, okay, I have to admit, this place was actually kind of cool. It's an adorable cafe hidden at the end of a street corner. But wait a minute, what's up with that sticker on the window? Isn't that the Leafmore High School symbol? No way we're setting foot in that taboo place. I tried tugging on Alice's arm and gesturing for us to leave, but she stood her ground and replied, Come on, Millie, we have to try their croissants. All the food bloggers are talking about it. But this is Leafmore's territory. Look! So, it's not like anyone will recognize us. Before I could comprehend what was happening, she dragged me inside. Oh well, it seems like we've gone too far to draw back, so I may as well sample what this place has to offer. Why was our order taking so long? And what was with Alice? Ugh, how many selfies did one girl need to take? I was clenching my fist to stop myself from anxiously fidgeting when two boys walked towards our table. Hey cutie, 
I've not seen you in here before. What grade are you in? Oh no. How should I answer this question? I quickly turned away, pretending to rummage through my bag to avoid his gaze. But they still didn't leave me alone, as the other guy said, Wait, this girl doesn't seem to be from our school. Are you? Oh snap! Did he recognize me? My skin turned clammy with nerves and I thought I was gonna throw up. Then suddenly a voice rang out. Sorry I'm late. Have you been waiting long? Then he plonked himself down next to us. Seeing that, the two guys left. Phew! But who is this guy? Do we know him? Oh my god! Heaven, it's you! Mmm. Is that the new Calvin Klein cologne? It smells amazing on you. Huh? Evan? As in, Evan Summers? The top student in Leafmore, aka my biggest competition in tomorrow's contest? To Alice's excitement and my puzzled look, Evan just lightly smiled, then got up to leave. <sighs> He's indeed a cold angel. What? All he was to me was arrogant. You're probably wondering what the deal between Willowmere and Leafmore is, right? They're the two biggest high schools in this town, but like the same poles of magnets, they repel each other. The two schools have been rivals since forever, competing with each other from academic achievements to collective activities. In competitions organized by the town, such as marathons, Halloween decorations, or even cooking contests. And of course, the students from both schools despise each other so much that we have boundaries in town. For example, this cafe is only for Leafmore students, while only Willowmere students are allowed in that bookstore. Breaking these rules could lead to outright carnage. The schools take this super seriously. Hence, there's even a rule saying we can't interact with each other. And dating is a real no-no. You see, as the top student in Willowmere, I can't let anyone find out I've stepped foot in Leafmore territory, as if they do, my life won't be worth living. And also, because of my number one position, I have a responsibility to help my school win as many prizes as possible. And this history contest is no exception. I anxiously waited for the host to announce the results. And the last 20 points go to Leafmore High School, which makes them the winners of today's contest. From the other side of the hall, the Leafmore students erupted into applause, and they all charged at Evan and hugged him. Seeing the arrogant Evan with a triumphant face made me even more upset. Congratulations, you were amazing! Alice, we lost! Only by five points! Second place is still good, but it was me who was defeated by that Evan! Poor Alice is still trying to keep her shy smile at me. I didn't want to take it out on her either, so I quickly left. The next day I was walking along the school corridor, minding my own business, when I passed a group of students gossiping about me. Poof, she defo lost the quiz on purpose. Yeah, her question was so easy. Everyone knows that the first US dollar was printed in 1862. Why were they saying such mean things about me? I tried my best to ignore their jibes and distract myself with my phone, but what is this? Someone had uploaded a picture of me, Alice, and Evan all sitting together in that cafe the other day. Oh no. And we're still, from this angle, we all looked kind of close. Furious, I went to leave, but Polly, this annoying girl, blocked my way and mocked me. Millie, if you don't like this place, you could have transferred schools. Losing to leave more on purpose is just embarrassing. I did no such thing. Not that it's any of your business. I hurried away from her and her smirking friends. The problem is, it seemed like the entire school had seen that picture and concluded that I'm a traitor. At least things couldn't get any worse, right? Wrong. My bad luck continued when I got my English Lit essay back. A B minus. This can't be right. I never get anything lower than an A. Ever! I was checking through my test when suddenly there was an announcement on the speaker, asking me to come to the principal's office. Millie, you're usually such an excellent student, but I've received some unpleasant news about you recently, and your grades are slipping significantly. I could only stare down at the floor and mumbled, I'm really sorry. I'd never been scolded by the principal before. This was the worst day of my life. Miss Garcia was silent for a moment before she continued. However, I still have faith in you, so I'm giving you one last chance to prove yourself. The town's hosting a Rube Goldberg machine camp and our school must win. Can you make that happen, Millie? I forced a smile and nodded. No problem, ma'am. The first prize will be ours. 
Trust me! This is my chance to show everyone that I'm devoted to this school. However, there's one teensy tiny problem. Physics is not my forte. It's all right, I just gotta do my best, right? I spent the next two weeks planning, researching, and testing out ideas with my group. We finally managed to create the perfect Rude Goldberg machine. It includes 15 genius steps to complete the final task. We're surely gonna secure all these bonus points. Finally, the camp weekend arrived, and I was super stoked to show off my team's entry. Tomorrow will be it. I'll get Willemere's name back on top again. Then suddenly, Miss Garcia tapped my shoulder and gestured me over to an empty corner and worriedly said, Leafmore's machine is highly praised by the judges. At this rate, they're most likely to win, and that'll mean humiliation for us. Don't worry, I'm trying my best. We'll add some extra magnets and springs. It's no use. The only way we'll win over Leafmore is if their entry encounters problems. She sighed, then turned to leave. Feeling deflated, I stared down at my feet. That's when I saw a pocket knife, with Miss Garcia's name printed on it, lying on the ground. I picked it up and called out, Miss, you dropped your knife! But Miss Garcia didn't stop walking or turn back, and just did a snipping gesture with her fingers. Could it be that Miss Garcia meant... Yep, definitely. That's the only way. So that night, I waited until everyone else was asleep, then I snuck into the gallery and cut a piece of wire holding the light bulb of Leafmore's model. That should be enough. I was about to leave the room when suddenly the lights came on. What are you doing here? I... I... You just did this, didn't you? Um... Yeah? So what? Go ahead, tell on me if you want. This is all so meaningless. Then he sat down and started fixing his model. Huh? What's meaningless? Good God, he's so full of himself. Fine then. Just you wait, Evan. I'll beat you with my own talent. Let's see if you'll still be Mr. Arrogant then. It was my team's turn, and for the first three steps, the Rube Goldberg machine worked quite smoothly. But when it came to the fourth step, suddenly the wooden slide collapsed, causing the marble to fall to the ground and the machine to stop working. We all stared at each other in panic. No, 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 this couldn't be happening. We tested it many times this morning and it had worked perfectly fine. I rushed over to check what was wrong with the machine, but I struggled and couldn't find a way to fix it. When suddenly a voice said, Let me see. I looked up. It was Evan. I stepped aside to make room for him when suddenly Ms. Garcia appeared. I see what's happened here. Clearly, Leafmore High knew the only way they'd win was by sabotaging the best entry. The whole hall started to stir, but I felt my skin prickle with unease. I didn't think this was Leafmore's doing. Look at Evan. He didn't even bother telling the judges about last night's incident. Immediately after that, Leafmore's principal, Miss Harris, said, Miss Garcia, you can't go around accusing us without proof. Clearly, you're the one who feels the need for underhand tactics to win, not us. Then she held out her phone and circled the crowd so everyone could see. I gasped in shock. There on the screen was a picture of me standing next to Leafmore's model with a knife. Miss Harris continued. Seeing as we managed to fix it in time, we decided not to mention anything else about it. But then you dared to accuse us. The crowd glared and tutted at me, and I longed for the floor to swallow me whole. I put blood, sweat, and tears into creating our model, and now people just thought I was a cheat. The worst part was they were right. I was one. The jury went off to discuss this. Then they announced their conclusion. Willowmere had been disqualified. Immediately, Mrs. Garcia piped in. This is hardly fair. That was the action of one individual, not the whole group. I assure you that Millie is no longer on the team, so let my school continue to compete without her. I froze in shock. How could Miss Garcia do this to me? It had been all her idea, hadn't it? She'd given me the knife. The realization of what just happened hit me and I fell to my knees and burst into tears. All that hard work and for nothing. Even Alice hugging me in comfort didn't release me from my gut-wrenching, sinking feeling. Then to my surprise, Evan said, Mrs. Garcia, can you explain why I found this knife with your name engraved on it next to our model? He raised the knife up for everyone to see. Oops, 
In all the stress of last night, I must have dropped it. Miss Garcia turned ghostly pale and everyone started to buzz about it. I can't believe you colluded with your students to do this. You're no different from her. Last night, Miss Harris instructed me to tamper with Willowmere's model, but I refused. As if we win, I wanted it to be fairly. The whole hall once again began to stir and gobbed on amazed as Evan continued. I'm so tired of the petty feud between our schools. It's so dumb and meaningless. The jury went off to discuss this further and came back with a new announcement. Both schools were disqualified. It's shameful. But, well, it's for the best. We really don't deserve to be here. Oh boy, that sure was eventful. The scandal between the two schools was hot gossip in the town for days. They even brought it up at the monthly town meeting. That's when the truth came out that Ms. Garcia and Ms. Harris had history. They were in the same year at school and were fiercely competitive against each other. So years later, when both of them became principals of the two schools, began this whole feud war. In the end, both principals were forced to leave their positions. So now what? Well, there aren't any dumb rules about where I can go anymore, which is good, because I actually really like it here. I've learned my lesson, and I'm never going to let anyone pressure me into cheating ever again. Peace has returned to school life, and it feels good. Oh, and as for Evan, I'm actually studying with him right now for our next Blast from the Past quiz. Only this time, I'm definitely going to beat him. Oh God, can I not save one from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? According to the poet, this world and all existing life is an illusion of sorts. As reality doesn't exist, philosophers refer to it as dream argument and dream hypothesis. What? What an interesting lesson! By the way, Look at how there's a ray of sunshine coming through the curtains. That's so pretty. This kind of weather indeed puts you in such a dreamy mood, huh? Yeah, right. But remember, there is no rose without thorns. That sunshine may look glorious, but it will harm your eyes. Yeah, I know. The maids always tell me that sunlight is the enemy for me. For my beautiful, sensitive blue eyes. Looking at it once, and I'll never be able to see anything again. That's why I've never been allowed to leave this castle. My maids all look identical in those masks, don't they? When I was a child, of course, I once got curious, and I pulled one of them off. As punishment, I was denied dessert for a whole week. And worse still, it wasn't worth it, as the maid's face was exceedingly ordinary. The masks looked far better. Anyway, I suppose all that matters is that they take great care of me. Each day they bring me food, water, and new clothes. I was sipping my leek and potato soup when I heard a scream. Let me out! Curious, I went and hid in a corner and saw two maids attempting to lock the screaming girl into a room. Hmm, I've never seen that girl in this castle before. I wonder if she's from the outside world. Poor her. It looks like she can't control herself. The world out there is scary. Perhaps it has sent her into madness. It's much safer here in the castle. I can play all day, paint, knit, and read. Oh, how peaceful. Hmm. But I still couldn't stop thinking about that poor girl. I wonder what will happen to her. The screaming didn't stop and my curiosity got the best of me, so I snuck into the girl's room. Shh, stop screaming. No one is listening. Uh, who are you? Uh, um, my name is Mistress. What's yours? <laughs> Mistress isn't a name. Are you stupid? It's just a name. Everybody here calls me that. This girl was so stubborn. She seemed to be wary of everything. Poor little outside world girl. After much persistence, she told me that her name was Nora. I was about to ask her why she was here, when suddenly two maids appeared and dragged me away. 
Mistress, you should not interact with this wicked girl. And you mustn't be late for your embroidery class. <sighs> it was nice to finally get to talk to a girl my own age. And I must admit that given her brash nature, I found Nora rather interesting. During class, I kept thinking about how I could sneak out and see her again. Ah! Ouch! That annoying girl screaming made me prick my finger. I ran out to check on her, but the maids immediately blocked my way. Perhaps I could talk some sense into her. Trust me, the last time I spoke to her, she was acting totally normal. The desperate maids exchanged looks, then let me go to her. As predicted, when I approached Nora, she stopped screaming. Hey, it's Ariana. That's my real name. Screaming never works here. Just pretend you're listening to my words, then I'll help you out. The maids were quite surprised when Nora immediately calmed herself down and showed signs of following directions, so they let us be and left. We began to chat, and ever since then, the maids let me see Nora every day. She told me how before her mother died, she gave Nora an address to find her biological father, who she'd never met before. Nora's grandma helped her set up a meeting with him and took her to the meeting point. She was so nervous, but happy at the same time to finally meet her dad. And at first, he was as kind and charming as she imagined. But then unexpectedly, right after they said goodbye to her grandma, he brought Nora here and let those masked people lock her up. But you're fortunate to be here, as it's safe. No! It's not. That's just what they want you to believe. Then Nora told me about the outside world, about her friends, school, and shopping malls. Every day, she even drew me paintings of the outside world, of beautiful memories with her family, her mom who passed away, and also her dad, even though she only met him once. Family? What is that? All I'd ever known were the faceless maids. The next day when I visited Nora as usual, she suddenly told me, Sis, we need to get out of here. What do you mean? This is my home. No, it's not. It's a prison. Who on earth stays inside for 14 years, huh? It's because of my eyes. I'll go blind if I go out there. My maids only want the best for me. That's why they keep me here. Are you crazy? You've been tricked. Just think about it. Do you know who gave birth to you? And why did that person leave you with these people? Or are these people the ones who took you away from your mom? Don't you want to find out the truth? This was my home, wasn't it? But thinking about what Nora just said, as well as the outside world that she rambled about every day, I suppose it would be interesting to experience it for myself. I'd just have to try my best to protect my eyes. So, I snuck into the housekeeper's room and stole the front door key. As we approached the main hall leading to the door, we saw a masked woman standing by a man. In his arms was a young girl, deep asleep. H huh? Th that's my dad! What? Did he come to pick you up or something? Don't you see that they're all in the same boat? And she's the ringleader! I peered closer at them and spotted the masked woman's silver hair and luxurious dress. Isn't that my tester? She lives in the grand suite and visits me weekly to assess my learning and etiquette. Mom, how are you going to handle this case? Just leave her in the empty room at the end of the hallway. As for Nora, I think she'll settle in properly in a week or so. Then we can start her etiquette and culture lessons. Which Nora? Ah, uh, I remember. Besides, you should restrict yourself a bit. Ariana, Nora, and now this child? Don't let the list of your illegitimate children be as long as your arm. Then you can just throw them away somewhere. Why bother raising them? They are my grandchildren, after all. They can't end up like those street rats. And who knows? They may become useful. But this has to be the last one. We can't risk Laura finding out about us. It would ruin our family's affluent name. Do you understand? I know. 
But fear not, as my wife is kind and foolish. She is completely clueless to these matters, thanks to your smart move. So we were this heartless man's illegitimate children? And because of his deceit, he was forcing us to live in darkness? I don't want to be locked up and lied to any longer. We needed to escape. From then on, Nora kept her act up and behaved like an angel, which eventually led to us being allowed to study together. And today is the day. Oriana is having a convulsion. We must take her to the hospital as soon as possible. However, the maids called the doctor to come round here instead. Oh, no, the plan was to escape when we were taken outside. If the doctor came here, he'd discover that my rashes were painted on and our plan would be disclosed. Okay, plan B. I was still lying on the bed playing the whole role of a patient while Nora locked the door of the room and went to the bathroom screaming. Help! There's a giant spider in here! As expected, the doctor went to check. The Nora immediately locked him in. Then we quickly took the knotted string made of the fabrics and embroidery class out from under the bed and then escaped through the window. Ah! I got my head between my hands as soon as I landed. I didn't expect it to be so bright outside. It's burning my eyes, Nora! What? There's no time for your hysterics. You'll be done if you're stuck here anyway. Just open your eyes and run! Hurry up! But I'm scared! Huh? Nothing happened. My eyes seemed fine. But no time to celebrate as then I saw... Oh my god. A couple of maids were chasing after me. Nora pulled my hand and ran towards the garden. Fortunately, we were already out of their sight when... Woof! Woof! A huge hound appeared out of nowhere and growled at us. I crouched down in a bush and watched Nora wave the dog closer, and then pat him. What? Magic! The dog suddenly became unusually obedient and led us to a secret place. A dog-sized passageway! I hesitated, but seeing the maids gaining on us, I reluctantly squeezed through it real quick. I can't believe I'm putting my destiny in the hands of this reckless girl. She said we had to get to her grandmother's house right away for help. What are those things running back and forth on the road? Why are they making that loud, annoying noise? Hmm. And why is Nora waving her arms about? Did she want them to stop? Too bad nobody did, as she's no princess. We kept wandering until we saw something which Nora called a truck parked on the roadside. She rushed over, then helped me onto the back of it. Oh, it was full of bananas. I stuffed my mouth full of them to ward off my starvation, while the scenery kept changing. That thing stopped, and we immediately got off before getting caught. I held her tight, frightened of all the people around us. They kept staring at me. And what kind of style was that? They all looked very peculiar. Maybe they were just commoners. Then we used our power to demand a man to take us to Nora's grandma's. Oh, it was exhausting. What? The outside is actually beautiful, sparkling with all those lights. And there are exhibitions of everything in the world, such as food, toys, flowers, and even creatures. Yes, everything. But the most important thing was that my eyes didn't get sore looking at those shiny things at all. Nora's grandma seems kind, but her home is full of the strangest of items. While Nora told her what had happened, I found myself bewitched by the talking black box on the wall. Suddenly, Nora's grandma led us to her far smaller truck and took us to somewhere called the Cops. They all wore these same funny outfits and bombarded us with dozens of confusing questions. And what exactly is an ID card? A few days later, there was news that the cops had caught my so-called dad, grandma, and maids also. As predicted, he was a womanizer, so when his lovers asked him to support his children, he was so afraid that his wife would find out that he took these children and locked them away in the castle. They're currently awaiting something called a trial, 
which Nora says is where bad people get their comeuppance. Whoa, the world outside is so busy. I didn't realize there'd be so many unmasked faces. And that strange talking box still startles me, especially when someone is holding a weapon. Nora says when I've adjusted to my new life a little more, I'll start school with her. And one day I'll even learn how to drive one of those smaller trucks. But firstly, she's teaching me how to dress like other people do and use this brick to communicate with them. This world is puzzling, but I'm sure with Nora's help, I'll soon find my feet. Even if it's just so I can learn how to reply to my dashing neighbor. Hi everyone. Have you ever had someone get revenge on you? It's not fun, right? Well, this is my story about revenge, but with a twist. You won't believe who my prankster turned out to be. Oh, let me introduce myself. I'm Audrey, and I'm 24. To say I've had an unhappy life would be an understatement. Firstly, my dad ditched my mom for another woman. And not long after that, my mom passed away from a serious illness. Basically, my entire life fell apart in a matter of months, and I was still too young at that time. It was tough growing up, and I always think that my life could never turn the page again. But on one fine day, someone popped into my life and changed everything. His name was Jim, and he was seven years older than me, and he seriously turned my life around. He lived in another city, but he often came to my city on business trips. We fell for each other quickly. That happiness didn't last long, though. One day I was working in the clothes store when a girl around the same age as me came in. She wanted my help to choose some dress, but she was pretty rude to me and I kept catching her staring at me with evil eyes. Who was she? And why was she treating me like that? Finally, after about two hours, she made up her mind and picked up only a tie that she wanted to buy for her husband instead. I was relieved to get rid of her, but shocked when I saw the name on her credit card. Jim Stewart. Her husband had the exact same name as my boyfriend. What a coincidence. She must have caught me staring at the card because she suddenly said, Yes, Jim is my husband. Now stay away from him. What? Her husband? My Jim. Before I even had a chance to react, she turned to everyone in the store and said, This girl is a gold digger and she's trying to break up my marriage. I was shocked. I tried to explain that it wasn't true, but she wouldn't listen to me. She just stormed out, and I was left standing there hearing people whispering about me. It was the most humiliating moment of my life. I immediately ran to the staff room and called Jim. I was really hoping it had all been a big misunderstanding, but I could tell from Jim's tone that it was the truth. He told me he'd lied to me, and that he actually lived in the same city. He just made up the business trip stuff so he wouldn't have to see me often. Then he said, Audrey... I honestly love you. I'm serious about us. Hang on, was he for real? It was ridiculous. I was disgusted by him. How could he treat me like that? I hung up and felt horrified. It brought back horrible memories of the woman who stole my dad away from my mom. I didn't want to be that woman. The next day, I moved out of the house Jim had rented for me. I didn't want to be associated with that loser anymore. But life works in mysterious ways. The day I moved into my new house, I saw Jim's wife. And you won't believe it. It seemed that she just moved in next door too. Was this some kind of joke? As soon as she saw me, she smirked and said, Wow, what a coincidence. Hello, neighbor. I'm Linda. Seeing her unpacking her stuff all by herself, I couldn't help but wonder where Jim was. But then I thought maybe Linda had ended things with him and had moved here alone. I hope so anyways. I'd hate to have Jim as a neighbor. So that's when my new life began. And it has been crazy ever since. From that first week of living there, Linda started pranking me. It all began with her throwing trash into my yard. I even caught her doing it, and she just grinned and said, Oops, my hand slipped. Then she walked away laughing. It made me furious. And that was just the beginning. One weekend, a delivery guy rocked up on my porch with ten extra-large pizzas. I tried to explain I hadn't ordered them, and that's when Linda appeared at my door and said, Oh, thanks for ordering me dinner, Audrey. I'm starving. Then she grabbed five of the pizzas and ran to her house, leaving me there with a bill of $100. Jeez, it was so annoying. And I had no option but to pay. Linda was too much. Seriously. As much as her pranks drove me up the wall, I also felt sorry for her. 
I knew what it was like to have someone you love stolen away from you. She must have hated me so much for ruining her marriage, even though it hadn't been my fault. I decided to just put up with her pranks. She'd get over it eventually, and it's not like they were harming me, right? Well, one night I heard the doorbell. I wasn't expecting anyone and was surprised to see a young guy standing there with a poster that said, I agree to be your boyfriend. Come out with me. I was totally puzzled and told him he had the wrong house, but then he showed me the address on the other side. It was my address. What on earth? I told him I wasn't interested, but he tried to grab my hand and said, Come on, girl, don't be shy. I told him if he didn't leave me alone, I'd call the police. So luckily he ran away. Needless to ask, I knew for sure that was Linda's joke, but this time she had taken it too far. I decided to go over and have a word with her once and for all. As I was walking to her house, I saw someone familiar on the other side of the road. I couldn't believe it. It was my dad? So many years had passed, and he'd completely changed, but there was no doubt it was him. I suddenly blurted out, Dad? But I didn't know what to do next. I was just thinking about my next move when I felt someone behind me. I turned around and saw Linda. She just smirked at me and walked away. What was her problem? Did she hear what I just said? I was so shocked at seeing my dad, I ran back into my house. I hated him for what he'd done to my mom. But he was still my dad, and I wanted to know if he was okay and what he was doing here. I barely slept that night as I couldn't stop thinking about my dad. The next morning, I was sitting by the window when he appeared again. This time, he was with Linda, and she was holding his arm. What was she doing with my dad? Why were they so close? Later that day, I saw him again, and this time, he and Linda were hugging. OMG, were they dating? Maybe Linda had heard me call him dad, and now she was flirting with him to truly get revenge on me. This was too much. The thought of Linda as a stepmom made me want to puke. I waited and waited, but he was inside her house and there was no sign of him leaving. Eventually, he left, and as soon as he was in his car, I ran over to her house. I was shaking as I knocked on the door, and as Linda opened it, I said, You are way too much. Can you just stop with the revenge already? Linda looked confused and said, What the heck are you talking about? Linda still didn't seem to get it. And I was about to explain when I heard footsteps. I turned around and my dad was right there. He said, What's the matter, Linda? Why are you fighting with this stranger? Huh? Stranger? Didn't he recognize me? Then Linda butted in and said, It's okay, Dad. We're just having a misunderstanding here. What? Dad? Is... He your dad? Really? I stammered. Yeah, why? What's the matter? He said, Linda, you don't need to lie to me. I know you're dating my dad to get revenge on me. I continued. Whoa, hold on. What do you mean your dad? Linda gasped. At that, my dad looked confused too and walked to me and asked if he could look at my hand. After seeing my birthmark, he started crying and hugging me. Audrey, it's you. It's really you. I didn't know how to react, so I just let him hug me. It had been so long since anyone had held me like this. Ever since my mom had died, I'd tried to be strong and keep it together, but suddenly I couldn't hold back anymore. I burst into tears in his arms. We stood like that for a long time, and eventually he took me into Linda's house and told me the story. It turned out, after he left me and my mom, he got tricked by that woman, and he was so ashamed he decided to move to another city and start over. He was working hard on a construction site one day when he got injured, so he ended up in hospital. And that's when he met Linda. She'd been in a car accident and needed a blood transfusion urgently. She has a pretty rare blood type, but luckily my dad had the same type and he volunteered to give her a transfusion. After that, they became quite close, and seeing as Linda had lost both her parents in the car accident, my dad eventually adopted her. I couldn't believe it. My dad had been through so much, and this whole time, I thought he was off living his life with a rich woman. I felt so bad for him and decided to leave the past behind and forgive him. As for Linda, she was also left confused by this coincidence, so she left the room to process everything, while I and dad took time to catch up on our lives. Later, Linda prepared dinner for us three, and before we digged in, she shyly grabbed my hand and said, Audrey, I've been so awful to you. I'm sorry. I know you aren't the one responsible for my divorce, but I still felt upset and that's why I played all those pranks. That was so childish, right? Please forgive me, sister. We laughed it off, then hugged each other to make peace. I couldn't believe it. After all these years of being lonely, 
Suddenly, I had a sister, and my dad was back. My life had finally turned a corner, and I almost laughed at the thought that it was all because of meeting Jim. At least one good thing had come out of that disastrous relationship. Oh, I've never been in a negotiation that lasted this long before. I've been here since three, and it's now eight. Worse still, I hadn't even mentioned the funding yet. I've tried, but it was Dane's fault. He kept on interrupting me and going off topic. As I looked at Dane, who was currently reenacting a soccer game with condiments, I wondered how on earth was he a part of the student council. He might have been a senior, but he was an average grade student who didn't seem to excel at anything. He also exaggerated everything and mainly just messed around. I should never have agreed with Dane to arrange the meeting here. Not only had I wasted five hours of my life, but it looked like the funding was a no deal. I couldn't take any more of this. Remind me never to listen to Dane ever again. I grabbed my bag and was about to stand up when Mr. Johnson turned to me. Ruth, I love your idea. Funding all of it would be a bit of a stretch, but I can go to 80%. And if it becomes a yearly thing, I'll be happy to continue sponsoring it. I stared at him open-mouthed. Did I hear him right? Mr. Johnson, the owner of the local music shop, was actually agreeing to provide a big chunk of the funding for our student talent show? By the way... I like this Dane guy. (laughs) Today's been fun. Dane wooed. Yes, it's a dealio. And enthusiastically shook Mr. Johnson's hand. Wait, I was supposed to be the one to close the deal. Never mind. We had the funding. This was amazing. We did it. Dane punched the air. Hey, um, how did you? He gave a Cheshire cat grin as he replied. Never expected that, did you? What do you think of me now, Ruth the new president? I shrugged and laughed. Hey, how about a celebratory hug, huh? He lunged at me with open arms. Well, why not? This deserved a celebration, after all. We were jumping up and down, and I don't know, maybe I was delirious from the stupidly long meeting or something. But the next thing I knew, we were kissing. OMG! We immediately pulled away from each other and awkwardly looked the other way. After that, he drove me home in silence. Oh, no. What was I thinking? Why did I, or anyone breathing, do that? It was Dane. Dane! Can you believe it? Well, okay, I suppose it'd been a difficult couple of months for me. As soon as I became president of the student council, my boyfriend Walter didn't congratulate me. No. Instead, he broke up with me. We'd been together for two years, but recently he'd spoken about marriage and buying a house. Um, not yet. I want to focus on my career first. But I guess me applying to the student's council and being all busy bee with work frustrated him even more. Now, I tried to distract myself with studying and council work, but I felt like I was getting ever closer to the edge of a cliff. One with hungry sharks circling the bottom. Ugh. And then there were the rumors being spread around school about me. Ruth's just a freshman. She won't be able to hack the pressure. And Ruth's so serious and boring. So I started working harder and harder to prove myself. Hence the talent show project. Only, geez, I was so exhausted. Both mentally and physically. This funding news was fantastic. But what was going on with Dane? Maybe he has some kind of secret power of attraction or something. Anyway, after that incident, he flooded me with calls and messages, even though I was crazy busy. After the twelfth call in a row, I stopped writing my essay and answered with an annoyed, What? Hey there, how are you feeling about the weather today? My name is Ruth, not there, and I don't care about the weather, I'm busy. Busy enough to correct my words like that? I don't think so. Ugh, fine. I agreed to go out for a quick coffee with him just so he'd stop bugging me. I stirred my spoon around my coffee as I glared at him and said, Will you stop calling me? I need to study. He stuffed the majority of his muffin into his mouth and took ages to chew it. 
Then he wiped his mouth onto the back of his arm and said, You do realize all the other council members call you Military Ruth, right? Try not to be so difficult and chillax once, will you? Wow, that sucked. I didn't expect to be liked by everyone, but I was working my butt off for the council so they could at least appreciate what I was doing for them. I cleared my throat. I don't care. Work is work. I didn't become the president to make friends. But I know you're not like that, Dane continued. You might be going through a tough time. Still, you're the most stunning person I've ever met. My face brightened up, even blushed. What did he just say? You're beautiful, strong, and independent. He reached out and took my hand, and I tried to ignore the fact it was sticky from his muffin. Ew. I must be the luckiest guy ever to date a girl like you, Ruth. Those other girls are just jealous of you. I mean, you have this hunk, and they don't. Hold up. He said what? Date? I gave him a disgusted, who do you think you are look. Reading my expression, his face dropped. Oh, I, um, thought there was something between us. I froze for a few seconds. Was I being too harsh? I mean, he was totally sweet saying those words earlier. Fine, listen carefully. I'll hang out with you. Not dating. But you have to promise, swear, that you'll never, ever tell anyone about it. I don't know. I mean, he was so immature and annoying, but I guess he was also kind of fun to be around. He made me laugh, and I liked that. All I did was work, work, work. And perhaps that was why Walter broke up with me, wasn't it? Maybe when I hang out with Dane, I should practice being less serious. One Sunday, when we were having brunch at a random cafe of his choice, I asked about his graduation coming up that summer and his plan. Honestly, I haven't thought any further than finishing my freshman year, he said between chewing on his sandwich. How about you? he asked. Well, I want to go to an Ivy League college for a master, of course, preferably Dartmouth, and study social science. Then I want to work for the government, but high up, you know, like a managing role, and really make an impact, you know? Dane shrugged after I finished. Yeah, nice plan. And kept digging in his food. I felt weird. Was I being unrealistic? Or was it just Dane's point of view? But to have a happy relationship, maybe it's best to compromise and accept the differences, right? I snapped myself back into the now. If this whole thing with Dane hadn't happened, I would still be in anguish and despair. It was strange, but I did feel better around him unlike with Walter, so I should respect his opinions. Gotta learn from my mistake, right? One day, I was at a council meeting planning a fundraiser for the remainder of the talent show money. I decided it was time people saw the real Dane, so I made him event organizer. But this didn't go down well. As in the other council members' eyes, Dane was a lazy, idiotic puppet. Give him a chance. He's the one who persuaded Mr. Johnson to fund the talent show. Please, we never know other people's limits and abilities. Then, this girl Catherine sarcastically said, Of course you'd know his ability since he's your boyfriend. You suck at leading. All you care about is your personal feelings. I know. I'll date you. Then I may actually get given a job I deserve. My tongue was tied. I couldn't find a word to defend myself. And at the same time, I was really, really mad at Dane. And worse still, he hadn't even bothered showing up for the meeting. Afterward, I went round to Dane's house and furiously banged on the door. Yelled at him the moment he opened it. How come people know that we've been hanging out? Dane silently scratched his head, eyes open wide, and stared awkwardly at some random spot. Answer me! I continued, but still, no reply. I pointed my finger at his face. I just went through a hurricane of rage in a meeting with the council to put you in charge of the fundraiser event. And you didn't even bother showing up. You better do an amazing job, else we'll both be dead. Then I stormed off. Over the next few days, the rumors continued to circulate about me. Clearly, 
Dane had been bragging to everyone that he'd managed to score himself a stiff girl like me. That I was no tigress, more like a lovely kitten. Now everyone was staring and laughing at me, and made meow sounds at me in the corridors. Someone even filled my seat in the council room with cat food. This was horrible to deal with, but instead of supporting me, Dane went rogue from school for a full week. He also didn't arrange the venue for the fundraiser, meaning we had to reschedule the event. I was left looking bad, so the teacher gave me a lecture on responsibility and strongly advised me to leave the student council. So that's what I did. Catherine's in charge now. After that, I couldn't face school. So I locked myself away in my room and cried as I thought back to all the things that had happened. First, Walter left me. Then everyone else on the council mocked me. Then I lost my position on the council I worked hard for because I put my trust in the wrong person. Ugh, Dane. (laughs) What he did hurt the most, as he was exactly what others described him as, childish and insensitive. I was torn between never wanting to see him again and also missing him like crazy. Now I had no one. I felt so alone. Ah, darn it. Loneliness sucked. So when he called me, I answered. He told me he was outside my house. I guess I should at least hear him out, right? Hey, beautiful, listen. He grabbed my hand and looked straight into my eyes. It doesn't matter, okay? The council, the president position, those people don't matter. The most important thing is you being happy, and I'm going to make you happy. I wanted so much to believe his words. So I let him take me out. We ended up in this noisy restaurant with singing waiting staff. He found it hilarious, but I felt so uncomfortable. Then on the way back, he dragged me into this arcade and left me so he could go on the zombie killing game. As I watched him spin around then shoot, I realized how different we were. I guess I was holding on to him because I'd lost everything else. Who was I anymore? I felt like a stranger to myself. This wasn't me, and Dane wasn't right for me. He rushed over to me and excitingly clung onto my arm. Ruth, come see my high score! I shook my head and quietly said, It's over. I pulled my arm free and walked off. After that, I kept to myself, and at school, avoided Dane and my former council members as much as possible. It did hurt when I saw the posters for the talent show around the school, but that wasn't my problem anymore. I did receive a message from Dane saying something about his graduation party, but I skipped it. The truth is, he's just not good for me. Life was a joke to him, and as a result of this, He left me feeling like I was a joke, too. I felt so lost. So I'm going to spend the summer with my grandparents out in the country, away from everyone and everything. I need time to heal, so when I come back, I'll be strong, confident, and independent girl I once was. As I really do miss that version of me. Each one of us needs to learn how to overcome things by ourselves, without relying on others. Especially when these others in question aren't any good for us. It was a normal, boring day in the grocery store. I was stacking milk in the fridge when Camilla, my co-worker, came and said, Layla, you have to help me. I have this date tomorrow night, but I'm busy. Could you please go instead? Wait, what? I don't even know your date. Besides, I have a boyfriend. Lincoln, remember? Then she began explaining to me about this dating service, and she assured me it was 100% legit. It was mainly lonely men who just wanted some company. All I had to do was talk to them, and of course, there was a strict no-hugging or kissing policy. At the end of the date, they'd pay me. No thanks. No way I was gonna do that. After my shift, I went home to see my landlady lingering in my doorway. She started yelling at me that I still owed her five months' worth of rent, and if I didn't pay it by the end of the week, she'd kick me out. I begged her to give me more time, but it was pointless. My God, what to do? Where could I get that much money on such short notice? Oh, wait a minute.
What about Camilla's dating service? It looks like I was out of choices, so I called her and agreed to go on the date. So here I am, on my weird date night. I put the most basic dress I could find on. Oh boy, I sure felt nervous. I have no idea what to say and how to act. Oh, that must be him. My god, Camilla. How could she forget to mention that the guy was in his 50s? People would think he's my sugar daddy. Ugh. Keep it together, Layla. I couldn't back out now, as my home depended on it. So, I slowly approached the man. At first, he looked surprised. That figures, I mean, he was expecting Camilla. I explained the situation to him, and he wasn't mad or anything. He just smiled at me, and we started chatting. He's called Mr. Hall. He lost his wife two years ago, and ever since then, he's been feeling lonely and needed someone to talk to. So that's why he started using this service. Hmm. He was actually pretty easy to talk to so the night quickly went by without any problem. After the date, he handed me an envelope and told me how grateful he was to me for listening to his burdens. I was itching to go home and open the envelope, but then he started going on about his heartbroken son. Suddenly, he was asking me if I'd talk to him. Obviously, I refused as this was a one-time thing to help out Camilla. Besides, I have a boyfriend. Speaking of which, he'll be so furious if he ever finds out about this. The next day, I paid the landlady two months' rent and assured her I'd have the rest with her soon. But to my shock, she just scowled at me and forced me to pay all at once. Well, guess where I am now? In a cafe, waiting for Mr. Hall and his son. Ugh. Oh, there he is. And that must be his son. Jeez, could he look any more annoyed? Hi, I'm Layla. Nice to meet you. Save it. I'm only here because he forced me to. So just let's get it over with. Layla, thank you for coming. This is my son, Leon. Please don't mind his attitude. Then Mr. Hall left us alone. Man, Leon was hard work. Any questions I asked him, he just shrugged or snorted. Then, when he finally spoke, he sarcastically said, So, Layla, I hope the money's worth it. What? How rude! Then he continued, you must be desperate. Don't you feel ashamed of yourself? Ah, oh, he was the rudest person I'd ever met. But yes, I was desperately in need of money. So I took a deep breath and started telling him about myself. When time ran out, I said goodbye to him and left. What an unpleasant experience, but at least that was the end of it, right? Wrong. As Mr. Hall asked me to meet him several more times. Who was I to argue? I mean, I needed the money. But Leon was getting on my nerves, as all he did was slouch in his seat, slurp his drink, and say nothing. So, it was down to me to do all of the talking. I began telling him all sorts of things, about my past, my family, and friends, and even about my future plans. And Leon just sat there listening to everything, supposedly. Luckily, it finally ended, and Mr. Hall paid me so I never had to meet Leon again. Because the last few weeks had been taken up with dating Mr. Hall and his son, I hadn't seen much of Lincoln. So, at the weekend, I invited him over to mine and cooked for him. We were sitting on the couch hugging while watching a movie when Lincoln said, in a serious tone, Layla, we need to talk. But then suddenly my phone rang. It was Mr. Hall. I quickly rushed to the balcony to pick up. He wanted me to be Leon's plus one at his eldest son's wedding, and he was willing to pay double? Ugh. That sounded awful, but besides rent, I also had to pay for college fees and food, and my measly income from the grocery store didn't come close to covering it at all, so I reluctantly agreed. When I returned inside, I asked Lincoln what he wanted to tell me. He hesitantly said that he had to go on a business trip for two weeks. Well, maybe it was for the best, so I could go with Leon without worrying about my boyfriend. Ugh, I felt so guilty. I swear this would be the last time I was going to do this. Leon arrived to pick me up. And as soon as he saw my dress, he insisted I couldn't wear such an ugly thing. Ugh, he was so rude. I told him I had nothing else suitable, so he drove me to a dress boutique, then told the staff to bring the most beautiful dress in store to try on. Oh my, it was stunning. I was overwhelmed when I saw myself in the mirror. Well, I definitely looked amazing in it. And Leon must be thinking that too, because he couldn't take my eyes off me. Ugh, it's such a shame. I can't afford it. But then before I could stop him, he went ahead and paid for it. Oh, how frustrating! 
I was sitting in the church waiting for the wedding to start while Leon flirted with some girls. Thank God Lincoln wasn't like that jerk. Then everyone went to their seats and the wedding began. The groom walked to the altar in this luxury-fitted suit. Man, it must be so nice to be rich. But isn't that... Is that... Lincoln? My Lincoln? Our eyes met, and he looked as shocked as I did. But instead of running to me and explaining everything, he just ignored me and continued with the wedding. I had to watch them saying their vows, exchanging rings, and kissing. I thought I was going to faint any minute now. Then at the wedding reception, Leon dragged me over to Lincoln and introduced me as his girlfriend. Awkward overload. And soon, some pretty girl distracted Leon again, so he chased after her. Then Lincoln immediately pulled me over to the stairwell. Why are you here with my brother? Were you cheating on me this whole time? Seriously? What about you? I'm not the one who just got married. Let me explain. It's not what it looks like. Right at that moment, Leon appeared and asked why we were here talking. I muttered out some story about trying to find the bathroom. Then I told Leon I had a headache and asked him to take me home. This was so confusing. How could my perfect boyfriend now be married to someone else? He kept on texting me saying he wanted to meet up and talk. I guess I needed to at least hear him out. The next day I met him at the museum, where we had our first date. So, his wife, Sandra, is the daughter of an affluential businessman who owns one of the biggest corporations in town. Lincoln's family company is in big debt, so his dad forced him to marry Sandra in order to save the company. Believe me when I say I don't have any feelings for Sandra. It's just business. I only love you. Please don't leave me. I promise as soon as the company is back on track, I'll file for divorce. Yeah, I know you probably think I'm crazy, but I still love him too. Besides, if the marriage is only temporary so he can save this family business, then that's understandable, right? He kissed me goodbye and left. But after that, Lincoln changed. Every time I texted and called him, he told me he was busy and would call me back. But he never did. I guess married life was preoccupying him. As if this wasn't frustrating enough, I had to put up with Leon. He kept on appearing at my place and bothering me. One time he showed up drunk, complaining about his ex-girlfriend, who'd just married someone else. Yeah, obviously it's far from worse than my current boyfriend just getting married. I tried to kick him out, but he'd already fallen asleep on my couch. The next morning I went to the kitchen to see Leon holding a picture of me and Lincoln and asking why we were on it. So I just shrugged and explained that we were a couple. Leon started laughing and calling me a fool. We argued back and forth, and in the end, I made him leave. I don't care what everyone thinks. I believe Lincoln. Then a few days later, I was walking out of college when I saw Mr. Hall waiting for me. He gave a slight sigh, then said, I will make this short. Stay away from Lincoln. He's married now. Layla, I'm fond of you, but if you try messing with Lincoln's marriage, I won't hesitate in making things complicated for you. Oh my god. I can't believe Leon snitched on me. Ugh, what a giant baby. In anger, I took out my phone and gave him a piece of my mind. Oh my god. I can't believe you told your dad about me and Lincoln. You're such a jerk. Just leave us alone and mind your own business. If you trust Lincoln, then that's on you. But he's not as innocent as he makes out. He and dad would do everything for the company. What did that mean? I hung up without letting him say another word. This jerk didn't even try to cover up his action. (laughs) I couldn't just let them do this. I needed to fight for us. So the next day, I walked straight into Mr. Hall's office, even though his secretary tried to stop me. I told him right to his face that I would never give up on Lincoln despite his threats. And you know what? Forcing your son to get married just to save the company makes you a coward. Mr. Hall burst out laughing. Well, what came next was far from funny. Turns out it was Lincoln's idea to marry Sandra. Leon was right. Both of them would do everything for the company. Another thing Leon didn't tell Mr. Hall about Lincoln and me. He saw us talking at the wedding. So we hired someone to investigate us. I was totally wrong about Leon. Right at that moment, Lincoln walked in and stopped dead on seeing me. Layla, what are you doing here? You liar. I can't believe I trusted you. Please hear me out. I took the iced coffee from Mr. Hall's desk and splashed it in Lincoln's lying face. We're done. Overcome with emotions and feeling like a massive fool, I rushed to the nearest bar to drown my sorrows. I was about to down my fourth shop when a hand stopped me. Can Lincoln just leave me alone? But when I looked up, it was Leon. 
Why are you so good to me? I mean, I blamed you for telling your dad. You should hate me. Because I like you. I felt like the room was spinning upon hearing his words. Then everything slowly came to light. Leon was devastated when his girlfriend broke up with him. But then he found out she did it to be with his brother. Yes, you heard me right. His ex was none other than Sandra. At first, Mr. Hall forced Leon to marry Sandra for the sake of the company. Even though Leon was crazy about her, he didn't want to marry her under those stipulations. Lincoln overheard their conversation, so to gain his father's trust, he charmed Sandra away from Leon. Oh my god, this family was crazy. I didn't want anything to do with any of them ever again. So I just rejected Leon's feelings, ran straight out of the bar, and cut off totally with all of them. So what now? Well, I graduated last month, so after that I decided I needed a fresh start in a shiny new city. So far, so good. I have a new job, which I adore. Hey guys, I'm Feather, and I look just like any other 16-year-old, right? Actually, my life as a teenager is far from ordinary since I have hemophilia, a rare disease in which my blood doesn't clot properly, so even a simple graze could be fatal. My parents are so worried that I might hurt myself that they keep me safely shut away in this mansion. In fact, I've never left it. Money isn't a problem to them as they own this massive energy corporation. So to compensate for me not being able to go outside, they make sure I get anything I ask for. My giant playroom is cool, right? Not only that, but I also own a dressing room with hundreds of cute Lolita outfits and an enormous pantry full of my favorite snacks that I can enjoy at any time. You see, there's honestly nothing to complain about, except I suppose it does get a bit lonely sometimes. Until one morning, I was woken up by a screeching noise coming from downstairs. Are you kidding me? Do you want to burn my throat with this or what? What's going on here? I went over to the living room and was stunned to see a girl sitting way too comfortably on our couch. I was still trying to figure out who she was when she suddenly said, You, standing at the door, get me another glass of cool water. Now. Taken aback, I instinctively went to get her water. Then the girl finally looked up and seemed startled to see me. Oh my, I'm terribly sorry. I thought you were just one of the maids. Turns out she's Katie, the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Forger, the two scientists that are collaborating with our family's corporation. My parents arranged for them to stay here to facilitate the research on the upcoming project. When I told her about my life and condition, she seemed really surprised. Oh, Feather, it's as if you live in your own tiny world. There are already flying cars out there, and they've just invented time machines too. You're missing out on so much. Really? How come no one told me about this? <laughs> I'm just joking, silly. Whoa, you weren't kidding about not leaving this place, were you? Then she started telling me about some of her favorite things to do in the outside world, such as watching the latest movies in the cinema, going to the mall where she could actually try things on before buying them, or attending all the fun festivals. It all sounds so cool. We chatted for ages, then I showed Katie around the mansion. Her reaction when seeing my dressing room and the playroom was seriously priceless. <laughs> From then on, I spent lots of time with Katie, but my favorite part about being around her were her stories about school, where she got to learn new things and make a lot of friends. Seeing my excited expression, Katie immediately suggested that I talk to my parents about maybe letting me experience it myself. Actually, it doesn't hurt to try, right? So at dinner, I gathered my courage to say, Mom, Dad, I want to go to school. I understand that you're worried for me, so Katie will come along to protect me. Right, Katie? Oh, yes, that's right. Feather is in good hands, Mr. and Mrs. Adams. My parents seemed very hesitant, but after a whole lot of persuading, they finally agreed with conditions. We'll join the most prestigious school in the state and have our own chauffeur. As for Katie, to avoid any incidents occurring, I suggest you get rid of the long nails and jewelry, Katie. We went back to my room after dinner, and I just couldn't hide my excitement. Yes, we'll get to go to school together soon. What should I prepare? What would you recommend? But then I noticed Katie staring in sorrow at her newly done set of nails. I'm so sorry, Katie. Is there anything I can do to make it up to you? It's okay, Feather. What matters is that you're able to go to school, and I'm so happy for you. It's bedtime anyways. I'll head back to my room now. I'm so lucky to have a friend like her. As I was indulging in my thoughts, a familiar voice startled me. Hey, I heard you two are going to school. Are you sure it's safe? Katie doesn't seem all that trustworthy. That is none of your business. You're just jealous that I've made a new friend while you're still lonely, aren't you? 
In case you're wondering, this guy is Liam, the butler's son. He was my childhood best friend and used to come to the mansion every day for homeschooling and to spend time with me. But we had some petty argument and I hadn't seen him since. Well, at least not until now. He was about to ramble about something else, but I slammed the door in his face. I wasn't going to let him ruin my mood. What I need to think about is my school day that's coming up. Oh my, it's so exciting, I really can't wait. Ah, we are going to Edgewood High today. So, I decided to wear my favorite Lolita dress as Katie suggested. Oh, I almost forgot, Mr. Freddy. He's been my best friend since childhood, and of course he had to come along with me on this big day. Katie also said I should try introducing him to everyone. That would help me make new friends faster. Such a brilliant idea. Whoa, we're finally here. Hey Katie, how do we find our lockers? Hey Katie, when is lunch? Hey Katie, do you know who's gonna teach us? Oh my god, Feather, stop asking, everyone's staring. Uh, I didn't even notice. It's probably because we're new. Hi, I'm Feather. Or maybe it's because of your extravagant outfit. Before I could say anything, someone spoke up. That's a lovely dress. Oh, you're right, they do seem to like my dress. <laughs> I waited for everyone in the room to settle, then confidently introduced myself. Hi everyone, I'm Feather, and this is my best friend, Mr. Freddy. As soon as they saw Mr. Freddy, everyone burst out laughing. I didn't know what was so funny, so I just awkwardly laughed along. After class, I asked Katie why our classmates laughed earlier, and what she told me was unbelievable. They were making fun of me. It's so sad to know, but I guess not everyone can be as nice as Katie. She also told me to dress down next time to attract less unwanted attention. It's a bit upsetting, but I guess I'll have to do what's best. So I listened to Katie's advice and ditched the OTT dress. Just like she said, people actually stopped staring at me. Here, hold this. You look really good holding books. Huh? That sounds kind of weird. But it's fine though. She probably wanted my help but was just too shy to ask. After the morning classes, I went to buy a bunch of lollipops, and that might look odd to Katie, so I let her know about how lollies are my special anxiety remedy. People here seem to be quite judgy, which got me a bit uneasy. You want one? Aw, poor you, but no thanks. By the way, I'll have lunch with David today, you know, the cute jock in our math class. So you're on your own this noon, okay? Then she quickly left without waiting for my response. I didn't know having lunch alone was so boring. Everyone has their own group, except for this one guy wearing a hoodie and a mask. H hi can I join you? But he didn't even reply, just stood up and moved to another seat. Did, did I do something wrong? Feeling the anxiety taking over, I immediately took a lollipop to calm myself down, and it's doing a wonderful job at making me feel better, but suddenly someone snatched it out of my hand. I chased after him, but slipped on someone's foot and fell hard on the floor. Panicked, I burst out crying, and I heard the guy that took my candy say, Ha huh, ha, huh, feather the toddler. Then everyone laughed at me again. Luckily, a guy spoke up. Stop this nonsense. What are you going to do if she's injured? Oh wait, it's the weird guy from lunch. He checked on me to make sure everything was fine, then quietly went back to his seat. I didn't even have the chance to ask for his name before the teacher came in. This guy was so strange, but there was one thing I didn't understand. Why was Katie also laughing? Back home, Katie came to find me in the playroom, and I questioned her about the incident earlier, and she quickly apologized as she thought they were just joking. She then suggested going shopping and offered to buy me something to cheer me up, and so I agreed immediately. We went to the mall the next morning, and I had the best time. We had iced coffee and some delicious pudding. Katie also got me an adorable little hair clip, and so I bought her a bunch of new clothes in return. We were about to head home when Katie said, Hey Feather, um, I have a cousin whose sneakers are falling apart. Would it be okay if you helped me get him a new pair? Of course, anything for my best friend. Making my best friend happy was the most wonderful feeling in the world. I'm so grateful to have such a lovely person like her to come into my life. But then the next day, I walked into class to see Katie being all lovey-dovey with the boy who took my lollipop. So that's the David that she mentioned, and on his feet were the brand new sneakers that were supposed to be for her cousin. Why is he wearing the shoes I bought? Then Katie pulled me outside and explained profusely, Feather, calm down. The, the shoes were too big for my cousin, so I gave them to David. I didn't lie to you, I promise. Fine. Please just don't let me see him wearing them again. I felt really bad since Katie seemed really sad after hearing what I said. At that moment, David approached me. What's up, toddler? You got a problem with my new kicks? I froze in fear. 
then thankfully an announcement came through the speaker. David Peterson, please come to the principal's office immediately. Turns out he's in trouble for spray painting a teacher's car. At least someone already helped me teach him a lesson, but that wasn't all. A few more of my classmates also got detention for cheating on the math quiz yesterday, while some others got caught skipping classes. It was such a crazy morning. It's as if someone was trying to play the hero here. Finally, it's lunch break. Hoped things would be better in the afternoon, but... Huh? What is this? A poster of me? It also says underneath, Feather the toddler is the snitch. Katie took a look at it and said that the best way to deal with these kinds of jokes was just to play along. Um, I'm not sure about that, but it seems like the only way now. And so, I climbed on an empty chair in the cafeteria and started speaking loud and clear. Mm, may I have everyone's attention, please? Hi, I am Feather the Toddler, and I am proud of it. Instead of getting the response I'd hoped for, what I got back was food. The whole cafeteria was laughing and throwing food at me. I covered my face, trying to dodge it, but the floor got slippery from all the greasy food, so I ended up falling. Oh no! I scratched myself! I could only lay on the ground out of pain. People finally stopped as they saw me bleed. All I could vaguely hear was a familiar voice calling my name. I woke up in the hospital to find Liam sitting next to me. Feather, you're awake. Do you feel pain anywhere? Well, Liam? Why are you here? Where's Katie? Katie? You're still worried about Katie? She's the one who was behind all this. She told the principal about your classmates and told everyone it was you to make them hate you. What? How is that possible? Turns out the guy who was always wearing a hoodie and mask was Liam. Liam had always been suspecting something shady in Katie's behavior. So after failing and warning me about her, he decided to look out for me himself instead. I cried and tried to hug him despite the pain on my arm. Then Liam showed me a shocking video of Katie talking trash about me to everyone. Oh, why was Feather carrying my books, you ask? It's because her parents work for my family's corporation and she'll do anything I tell her to as long as I give her some money. <laughs> Seeing the anger and also disappointment in my eyes, Liam calmed me down and said he had a plan to expose my so-called best friend. When I returned to school a few days later, I stormed straight over to Katie. It's you! You're behind it all! I already know everything. <laughs> Stop being ridiculous, Feather. You got busted and now you're trying to blame me. Drop the act. No one's falling for it. At the end of class, Katie suddenly gathered everyone. People, head over to the lecture hall. I have something very interesting to show you guys. Oh boy, I wonder what else she has planned. Liam and I quickly followed the crowd and found Katie standing on stage. Oh, Feather, I'm glad you're here. This is about you after all. The screen started playing a video of me sitting on my swing, playing with my dolls, and taking armfuls of candy out of the pantry. Do you see that, everyone? Feather is just a toddler in a teenager's body. Such a weirdo. I was waiting for everyone to start laughing, but the crowd stayed completely silent. Then Katie hesitantly continued, Not only that, she's also the poser who snitched on us. Then, to her surprise, the angry crowd started booing and shouting at Katie, saying she is the evil snitch. Then they turned to me. Your rooms are actually pretty cool. I wish I had a snack pantry like that. It's so awesome. Katie sounded panicked as she continued talking more trash stuff about me, but no one listened. Turns out, Liam had set up a group chat in which he would posted proof of Katie's actions, including the video of her talking to David, and also pictures of her coyly walking out of the principal's office after she must have snitched on everyone, and her putting up that mean poster about me. Katie, you're the one embarrassing yourself. Everyone knows that you're a snake in the grass. I trusted you, and what I get back are all these lies and schemes. I feel so ashamed for ever calling you a friend. As Katie looked around at the unimpressed looking crowd, she realized her game was up and quickly fled the scene. Later on, we arrived home to see my angry looking parents standing next to Katie's mom and dad who had all their luggage packed ready to move out. Yes, Liam had already told them everything. In the end, Katie's parents made her apologize to me. Only after a lot of persuading did my parents let them keep their jobs. I never saw Katie again, but I did make a bunch of new friends that I invite around sometimes. The snack pantry is a big hit. <laughs> Now, I wear whatever I like without worrying about being judged. Most of all, I'm enjoying my school life, and it's all thanks to the help of my trusty soulmate, Liam.